Good afternoon. As it is 2 p.m., I will call this City Council workshop of February 28, 2024 to order. This will be both a physical meeting and a virtual meeting. Some members of city staff or consultants may be participating via teleconference. Today's meeting may be viewed live on YouTube, Facebook, and available for viewing after the meeting on cable channel 10 HD 1090. Public comment is not normally taken at workshop meetings, although the council may allow or request public participation. We do, we do have two items for action on our agenda today. Right now, I'd like to take a moment to say that our thoughts are with the city of Baltimore, Maryland in the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge and the families of those injured or lost in this tragic accident. Special meetings, the city council will be holding two special council meetings this April. The first will be on April 10th at 2 p.m. here in council chambers. The purpose of that meeting is to discuss the council's overarching priorities and how they relate to our budget planning. Deputy City Administrator Goldman has sent budget information to the council in preparation for that meeting. The second special meeting is a joint meeting with the Island County Board of Commissioners on April 23rd at 1 p.m. The purpose of the special meeting is to review and discuss land use policies and regulations of mutual interest. That special meeting will be held at the Whidbey campus of Skagit Valley College, room A306. Both meetings are open to public, but public comment will not be taken. With that, we'll move right into our items, parks and recreation, action item, marina electrical repairs, resolution 24-12. And presenting on this issue today will be our recreation director, parks and recreation director, Brian Smith. Council. Hi, Sim. All right, as you're aware, we have uh, a um, emergency declaration request and, and resolution before you. Um, about a year ago, we presented council with the draft findings of the Marina business plan, identifying critical needs in two areas, dredging and infrastructure, namely docks and, and our power. The Marina is 50 years old uh, this year. It is starting to show its age, uh, despite the best efforts of our outstanding Marina staff. On about a week ago, we had an electrician come out to investigate an electrical issue we found discovered um, and discovered a serious uh, electrical system failure that was causing one of the main power lines to arc, it requiring us to immediately shut down the line, cutting power to EF and G docks outlined in red there. Uh, the power outage impacts approximately 120 vessels, including liveaboards. Uh, affecting things like boat batteries, refrigerators, bilge pumps, uh, other electrical systems on the vessels, as well as marina systems like our security cameras, Wi-Fi, the dock lo safety lighting, and the channel markers, uh, creating serious safety, security, and navigational hazards. Uh, we've accommodated all the liveaboards that have requested to be moved to an area where there is electricity. Uh, moving forward, we're checking in with those liveaboards that decided to stay where they are at uh, regularly to ensure that they're doing all they're doing all right and don't need to be relocated uh, we are communicating with all other vessels that wish to uh, be relocated based on slip sizes and availability our stellar marina staff are working tirelessly to answer questions and accommodate our tenants and guests in any way that we can uh, this is an example of what those uh, lines look like they're uh, they are encased within conduits uh, connected to several junction boxes. Uh, you see that on the left. Um, we want and need to replace these with uh, two cables inside sleeves uh, without the junction boxes. And so kind of looking at what our current uh, conditions are, uh, you see that the conduit leaves the junction box number one there on the right hand side. It runs underneath the north side of the dock about a foot and a half under the water. Uh, up to junction box two and then connect and then connecting on to the rest of them through five uh, the fit we also have a failed feeder that goes from junction box one to junction box four uh, the conduits have separated from the J boxes and allowing water infiltration additionally the protective sleeving encasing the power lines uh, within the conduit has worn out and that's just naturally happening over time but with the the movement of those conduits um, with the joints separated, that's caused splits and exposure of that uh, 480 volt 
uh, feeder, feeders themselves, and that's caused them to arc and interact with the water, which is uh, what alerted us to the issues. So what we want to do is remove those 410-foot uh, uh, field feeder wires. Uh, we'll install, it's, it's really pretty simple, we'll just install uh, two 410-foot uh, lines from the, from the junction box all the way over and um, pull two G cables or miners cables, or call that because they're, they're very robust, they use them in, mi in mining shafts. Um, so there'll be a total of 820 feet of cable. Uh, the repair sections of the conduit uh, in the bull rail where they have separated from the junction boxes. Uh, we'll put in expansion couplers for that. So it, it's a simple project. Uh, we are investigating if we can run it along uh, the whalers or on top of the dock, uh, out of the water, making sure um, that they won't be a safety issue. And, and we're working with a couple different contractors to figure out the best solution around that right now. Uh, we've reached out to three electricians to come and evaluate the issue. Elite Electrical and PNW Electrical both did site evaluations and are providing proposals for how to proceed. Uh, the third uh, didn't show up for the evaluation um, or issue or provide a quote. So uh, we have received two cost estimates uh, from each of those, one for about 60000 another for about $75,000. The one for 60,000 did make a note that based off prevailing wages on, that's based off prevailing wages during normal business hours. And there could be as much as about $11,500 added for um, out of normal work hours, uh, labor time. Uh, another thing to kind of note with this, L9 is pretty big on GIF protections. Um, there is a risk they may require us to upgrade the grandfathered in system that would make the repairs significantly more expensive. Um, we haven't received any indication that that's going to be the case, but just to kind of have it on your radar. Uh, the G cable is a specialized item. It comes uh, directly from the manufacturer. If all goes well, it should take about two to three weeks to get here, but uh, distribution and um, shipping, shipping scheduling has been unreliable. Um, so we're trying to be conservative with that and communicate as best as we can to, to tenants on to schedule for the, the project. Um, per RCW 34.08.280, the city council may by resolution waive competitive bidding requirements to adequately respond to emergencies. Um, this is found also in the city's purchasing policy under 1.13 declared emergencies. Uh, as defined as unforeseen circumstances beyond the control of the city that either A, presents a real immediate threat to the proper performance of essential functions, or B, will likely result in material loss or damage to property, uh, bodily injury or loss of life if immediate action is not taken. Uh, due to the nature of the impacts fulfilling both those requirements, staff recommends um, the presented motion for expedited repairs. Um, and I have our Harbor Master, Chris Sublet here, who, uh, uh, if you have any questions for either me or him, um, we're happy to answer those. Great. Thanks, Brian. So before I turn it over to council, do you guys want to see if there's any public comment on this before? Or do you want to just put, yeah, you do. So Julie, have we received any public comment or is there anyone that wishes to speak on this topic? We did not receive um, comment in advance, Mayor. Um, I don't have anyone on the sign-up sheet right now, but we can certainly ask the audience okay. if anyone present would like Great. to speak. Thank you. So is there anyone that's here with us this afternoon that would like to speak on this topic before I turn it over to Council to ask their questions? All right, hearing none, Council, do you have any questions or comments on this issue? Yes, Council Member Hoffmeyer. Yeah, you know, this... Uh the situation here is a little frustrating, not not with staff because I'm sure I'm sure the lack of funding frustrates you you guys as well. You know, just looking at the couple pictures you provided, and then uh, you know, recalling back to about two years ago when a former council member uh, shared some pictures of what was going on down there. I mean, this this very problem was what he foretold in some of those pictures. So, uh, I know it's an emergency this at this point because the power's out, but it's something that we probably had a pretty good idea that we were gonna have issues like this. So I guess my, my only question is, we obviously have to deal with this, 
but how much of a band-aid is this and what other issues do we think may be lurking with the electrical system for instance yeah so uh you know this repairs a section of the overall electrical system for the marina um this this uh current electrical system was put in about 1990 replacing the original electrical system uh, we haven't been able to evaluate at the level that we did with this uh, current failure whether we're, we're getting close to having similar issues with other areas of the marina um, do you want to speak to anything else with that yeah so the the big challenge with the marina electrical system is much of it is underwater the challenge is we know the area that it's broken. They were able to test it and say it's broken between this spot and this spot. And the range in that area is about 400 feet. The challenge is it's, it's something you can't see because it's a foot and a half underwater and it's in conduit. So we have no way to know that it's exactly within these six inches or 12 inches. And that's why it's, it's replacing the whole cable. The rest of the marina is, is in a similar situation. We can test it today and it'll test perfect, but there's no telling what's happening with the current and the wind and the waves that's moving that conduit, shaking those wires, chafing the casings on the outside, all of that. So it's, it's an extreme challenge to really say this, play, this section is failing because again, it could test perfect today. We get a windstorm and it, it doesn't test well the next day. So everything at the marina is underwater and a super challenge to maintain. That, that makes lots of sense. And then my only other question on this one is um, when we're looking into the future at possibly realigning uh, some of the docks and stuff, does, would this prohibit us from doing that? No, no. In, in fact, um, in a roundabout way, this is buying cable for the future. Depending upon if we run it through the water or we run it along the top of the dock and in and, and the specific ways all of that is done, it's likely we'll be able to reuse this cable for the, the next generation of the marina. Good, good, good. Hey, thank you and hopefully we can get you guys some help down there. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Hoffmeyer. Councilmember Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. So, Chris, you just kind of touched on, on one of my questions is, does it have to go underwater? I mean, is this a potential that since we're replacing it that we can run it alongside the dock or on top of the dock or something along those lines so it's not so challenging in the future? Yes, that is, that is one of the options is to run it alongside or on top of the dock right now uh -huh. and put a, a cover over it. The only challenge is it may create a trip hazard, so we're trying to figure out ways to alleviate that. Okay. Then what we'll do simultaneously is we have a budgeted item to replace the whalers along that edge of the dock as well. And once that's done, we would move it to mount on the edge of the dock above the water line and protect it more, which would also make it easier if anything were ever to happen again. Then we could isolate that, that 12 inches or six inches where it's broken. Right. But yes, certainly that is one of the options we're looking at. Okay. I would certainly encourage that option if that's a possibility. Yeah. And the other question I had is, is does this $90,000 include that possibility of having to update the GFI that, that you had mentioned, Brian? Or does that, is that going to be in addition to? At this point, we're not 100% sure. Based on the estimates that we've received of sixty and $75,000, there, there is some cushion between there and the $90,000. So we believe that it'll cover it, but we've got these estimates so fast that they haven't been able to piece out everything. That's why we pr created that buffer in there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Marshall. Anyone else? Yes, Council Member Wigenstein. A um, couple of questions. Um, is this gonna come out of the general fund? No, so this will come from uh, boater user fees, which uh, feed into our capital improvements with the marina and our reserves. Okay, uh, thank you. And out of curiosity, and I know we don't have estimates, but if we were to just kind of do our best guess, what would, it, what would the cost be for the entire electrical for the marina? Just out of, I'm just curious. Ta what did it cost last time? Maybe that's probably a better question. Yeah, so, so we're not just talking about replacing lines, you know, yeah. everything you're, you're getting into. A couple mil you know, or what? Yeah, maybe seven figures. Yeah. I know you don't want to be locked into a, a number, and I'm not really asking for that. I'm just trying to get an idea of what we're looking at, yeah. you know, into the future. So. Yeah. 
I hear that a lot, but then we get quoted later. So. <laughs> I'm not quoting it's on yet. record. We'll let the newspaper do that. Thank you, Councilmember Wigginstein. Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Stuckey. It's not like we're going to say we're not going to do this. So I'm going to make the motion. I move to approve resolution 2412 Oak Harbor Marina electrical main supply cable repair and authorize the mayor to approve the expenditure of funds in an amount not to exceed $90,000 for emergency repair and replacement of electrical system components at the Oak Harbor Marina. Second. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Is there any other discussion on this issue before we call for a vote? None, none, hearing none, we will say all in favor, raise your right hand. Passes unanimously, thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Thanks. Next, we will have a presentation on the inclusive region, regional playground and to present again will be Brian Smith, who's on deck. That'd be great. You know, I would love to sit down at a table for a work session. I, I think we should look at that. All right. So uh, inclusive regional playground identified as one of the council's uh, priorities. It's included in one of our top priorities for recreational facilities. Uh, it was also one of our um, top priorities and improvements that the community wanted to see as f associated with the wind jammer improvements. What we're really talking about here is addressing underserved uh, populations specifically. Our purpose as a department is to build recreational facilities that are versatile, adaptable, uh, to meet the needs of all residents of the community. And the goal really is to provide a well-rounded selection of recreation programs and activities uh, and facilities for all ages and all abilities. Uh, in a, in a three-month study uh, that was done by the Recreation Parks Association into this issue, nearly all uh, families that had children with disabilities felt that they were missing out on play opportunities vital to the emotional, social, and physical development of their, their children. So why inclusive play? It's, it's really not so much about meeting special needs as it is about a holistic approach of meeting everyone's needs to play, whether they choose, where they choose, in a variety of different ways. And we're not just talking about children, but we're talking about caregivers, parents, grandparents that might have a, a disability as well. And uh, when we talk about a disability, it's really only about 3% that have a physical disability. We say the word uh, disability, you think wheelchair. Um, a, a much larger need is those with, uh, with uh, developmental uh, disabilities, uh, even things like uh, social and, um, and uh, communication uh, issues and things like that. So when you look at a snapshot, and we're trying to get these figures, we're working with the school district on it as well, of really understanding how much of an issue this is, Oak Harbor, doesn't have an all-inclusive playground where people with disabilities can improve their physical, cognitive, and social skills side by side with their able-bodied friends. These children are on the outside looking in. They're missing out on a crucial component of he healthy, typical development. It is difficult for children to grow up in an emotionally stable, emotionally stable if they are denied space and freedom to take and overcome risks, and if they are denied the opportunity to make friends with others of their own age. Uh, something to note is that um, we are, our community is um, largely made up of the Naval Air Station and uh, the Naval Air Station here is um, identified as a, um, it's called a, you'll have to hold me here. Exceptional yeah, exceptional, family. Yes, exceptional family base, thank you. Uh, so they're, um, they are particularly equipped to uh, bring in families with special needs. Um, this is uh, fairly unique and also a, a really interesting uh, opportunity for our community to support the Navy in this, uh, in this mission. Um, Captain Hanks listed with his top issues, one was child care, and two was creating a community uh, for enlisted in their families um, where they address the issues of things like loneliness and isolation issues, looking for recreation solutions, or these families won't re-enlist. Those are his two top issues um, that he's shared with the community. And, it, and they've 
had several conversations about how do we address this? How do we create facilities and opportunities for these families, especially for families with special needs? Um, and what kind of partnerships are available? So uh, just want to share with you, um, this is my, my buddy Turner uh, Faltzko, right there in the middle there. Uh, Turner was originally diagnosed with cerebral palsy. He actually has a very um, rare uh, genetic disorder. It's called uh, KIF1A. It's an associated neurological disorder. It's, he's only one of about 250 cases in the United States. But uh, this is, this is uh, Turner when I first met him uh, about seven years ago. Uh, and uh, when I met him and his mom, Jenny, they came to me and said, Turner goes to the park all the time with his friends. He has a ton of friends and buddies who love to go everywhere with him. And he is constantly unable to play with him. This, this really is uh, Turner's situation. All they wanted to do was work with us to figure out how can we allow Turner to have the same play opportunities as the rest of his friends. Um, we worked with this issue. Uh, this was in Glenwood Springs and uh, went after grant funding. We went, we went through um, uh, contractors to help us with design and community feedback. And, and it's taken seven years. We were finally ready to, to implement the project and build it. We were able to get $900,000 out of the Land Water Conservation Fund to, to build the project. And we had an outpouring of community support. But this is Turner today. Uh, you know, he's quite a bit older. Um, his playground days are, are getting close to being behind him. But childhood doesn't wait for government's purposely um, measured progress. And I don't want to meet any more families in our community that have this need, that have to wait for their, um, excuse me, for their uh, childhood to go by before they can see a project like this happen. Uh, currently, we have uh, quite a bit of a drive for these families, about an hour and a half to the nearest uh, inclusive playground. There's a few ar ar around Everett as well, uh, Mountain Lake Terrace, uh, Hazel Miller's universally accept accessible playground uh, was just completed last year. They had budgeted about 750000 for it. They had a LWCF grant uh, uh, that helped fund that as well as a generous um, donation from the Hazel Miller Foundation and uh, park impact fees to put that uh, together. But, uh, you know, this is typical. Um, and it's not just families with disabilities. My family, we would travel an hour to uh, go to the Canyon View Playground, which was uh, the nearest accessible playground to us when we lived in uh, Glenwood Springs in Colorado, simply because it was an awesome playground. I and mean, these playgrounds are are super fun. They're designed for people of all abilities. And because of that, they're also uh, less intimidating for, for children of all ability levels, even if they are able-bodied children. So what's this look like? You know, um, we're looking at probably about a 12,000 to 15,000 square foot uh, uh, playground. We'd want to have it in a, uh, enclosed with a, a fence for safety re reasons that for kids that are uh, a run risk. Um, it would have accessible, poor in place surfacing, uh, exciting adaptive equipment, inclusive apparatus layout with uh, two to five year olds, five to 12 year olds, and then uh, a teen section as well. Centrally located, uh, ha has strong community support, high utilization. Um, we'd want it in an area that is uh, centralized, uh, has adequate and plentiful parking, especially with handicap stalls near other amenities, and is pedestrian friendly. Uh, so the question that council always gets itchy on is, okay, well, how do we pay for this? Uh, great priority, definitely a softball pitch uh, to the community to get support on, uh, so funding. We are applying for a land water conservation fund grant for $700,000. It's a 50% match uh, for that grant. Uh, we anticipate at the size of our community, we can bring in about 100,000 plus in community donations, uh, possibly looking at uh, foundations to help with that as well. We have a lot of needs in the community. We have a very few organizations that service those needs, but there's a lot of uh, desire for support opportunities. So it's about a $1.1 uh, million project. Uh, 
we, I already mentioned the exceptional family base, um, possible partnership with uh, Navy community um, resources. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities with partnership for service clubs like uh, Rotary Club, um, Lions Club, and different organizations like that. They, they love these kind of projects. They're just feel-good projects and something that the community can really be proud about. Uh, Island County is also a great uh, partner for projects like this. Um, a couple years ago, they gave 226000 to Freeland for uh, a playground project uh, in, this, in this realm. Um, Park impact fees, uh, REIT funding, uh, also help with the, the program match as well. Uh, I'd love to, to share this just briefly as well. This is Isaac Alonzo. He was a participant in one of our special recreation programs uh, that I created for the last city I worked for um, that we got that 900,000 uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund Inclusive Playground Grant. Um, the program was recently highlighted this last year on the National uh, Parks and Recreation Association magazine as uh, at its outstanding uh, inclusive program. And that's what I want to build for our community here. We have way more of the need than Littlewood Springs had and a lot more of the opportunity to provide services for the community. Um, also mentioned that uh, state organizations love to be partners with these kind of things. The creation of the, of the governor's office for outdoor recreation that almost every state has started with uh, an endeavor that we had um, with the governor's office of economic development at, in Utah when I worked there. And I was on a committee that helped uh, present uh, the economic impact of outdoor recreation in the state, which was second only to the medical field. Um, that opened the governor's eyes and we created the first office of outdoor recreation in the country, which is a format that has been copied in almost every single state now. And that was based off of an uh, initiative called um, Accessible Utah. And the point of it was to provide and improve outdoor recreation spaces for people of all abilities, to create trailheads and, tra and make trails ADA accessible, uh, to remove barriers to participation. And I'll just, I'll, I'll end on this. We have a lot of, um, of support in this in our community. I feel that working together, we can create an all-inclusive play environment and better our community, create a regional attraction that allows children, parents, and grandparents, anyone with disabilities or special needs to finally have the opportunity to join in on that joy that comes from participating. And once we create the what I intend to be the best all-inclusive playground in the state of Washington and the first all-inclusive playground in Island County region, I think we will have checked off a major um, point to our to-do list and something that we can be really proud of and hopefully get some recognition from media and win a few awards around our efforts to service a real need in our community. Happy to answer any questions that you have or any discussion that you'd like to have on this this issue. Great. Thanks, Brian. And with that, I will turn it over to Council. Yes, Councilmember Wiesner. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I think you know how I feel about this, Brian. During my time on the Parks Board, I absolutely support it. And thank you, Carrie Stuckey, for being a compassionate advocate to move this forward. And, and uh, Brian, for, for picking this up. I know we've hit you with a, a lot of priorities, right, that you could have picked up beside this one. And I appreciate you seeing the importance and the need for this one to to move forward out of that that stack of of things we've hit you with so um yeah i think you probably had all of us at uh you know the idea right and and, and the rest of the presentation was just you know fluff right i i don't think uh, personally myself i don't have to be sold on on this concept and and do we have any sort of an idea of, of where we would locate yeah we've evaluated a few sites we we're looking at um what the life expectancy was left on the playground at Fort Nugent Park. Those uh, kind of wooden structure type playgrounds uh, don't last as long as, as others and uh, they can start to rot out where you can't see underground. So uh, Brandon and his team did uh, evaluation of that. We still have actually several good years of that playground. So we wouldn't, um, that was kind of our first idea is if we're getting towards the end of life, maybe that's a location we want to replace it with this. Uh, since that's not the case, uh, Windjammer, which uh, 
had a playground already included in the development plan for it uh, is the site we're looking at. There's a few other locations we could look at. We'll probably evaluate those, but right now, that meets all the check marks of what we would want for this kind of a playground. You definitely want to have it centrally located for accessibility reasons. So uh, the west side of Windjammer Park is where we're, we're targeting. Well, and, I, and I'm glad to hear that uh, because quite frankly, you know, my, my thoughts on all of that is, uh, you know, as a, a city progresses, obviously we do need to update our park spaces, right? And, and we need to update them uh, um, as our community needs it. Uh, a, a good little thing in our priority workshop coming up, I like the little sentence at the bottom, we are what we fund, right? And, and uh, I understand that once we get the plans in place is half the battle, right? Because, you know, the, 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 the grants are awarded to those communities that, you know, are, are, are most put together on, on the idea and the specific use. And, and obviously, uh, you can sell this one, right? I mean, you put the picture of the kids up there, right? So, um, I, I'm glad to see we're aligned that, that, that you know, we're going to add to our park space. We're going to add another playground. Uh, 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 and uh, I'm glad to see that we're, we're thinking along the same lines of let's spend the money on the park itself, not on all the parking and the stormwater and, the, you know, all of that stuff, uh, you know. So uh, that, that certainly would be a, a logical place. We've got the parking there. We already have, uh, you know, handicap accessible uh, parking stalls, we have ramping and sidewalks and everything designed uh, for that. So that, that makes absolute sense. So um, yeah, on board. And, and again, thanks for, for both you and Carrie for being advocates for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wiesner. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you. When we did the original Windjammer redesign and in, installed the Splash Park, uh, accessibility was a major part of the conversations around designing that was the splash work was designed with help from the community with charrettes and stuff and so it was really important that it be usable by as many people as possible but that is I mean that's like this much of a kids year-round playing I mean the splash how often are they gonna actually use that so you know the other 360 days a year they're they're gonna need <laughs> they're gonna need something um, a little bigger, a little better. I think that um, this is also a perfect opportunity for the public to give us feedback about what would work for them, for all of the parents and the children to say, you know, if you, if you just had a blank or if this was set up in such a way, um, it, that would be, because yeah, how does one kind of begin there's a lot there's literature and you can copy other people's but if there's someone in the community that has a real specific idea or need um, or would like to see I think that this is an incredible opportunity to kind of gather all of that information um, and get get to know the people in our community and be able to use that information as we go forward with programs and updating other parks and stuff so you know this checks all the boxes and um, looking forward to helping get it off the ground in any way that I can. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Hoffmeyer. <clears throat> yeah, Brian, uh, seeing your eyes light up the way they did talking mm -hmm. about your friend Turner, you know, uh, you're good people. There's a, uh, I think I'd be willing to take about any hill with you. So this is a, certainly a fun priority to get behind. Um, with all the, you know, with all the government mandates that are out there, you know, uh, such as accessible facilities, you know, I'm rather surprised that inclusive facilities aren't a requirement and maybe, maybe they will be someday when it comes to public parks, but, uh, certainly, certainly a good thing to be ahead of the curve on that. Uh, you know, the only other thing I had, you know, I was a little, uh, I was a little interested to, uh, possibly hear from our, uh, Parks Board Chair, I would love to. I would love to hear how this would uh, positively impact local families. I gave her a heads up. Mm. We might have questions. Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Stuckey. Um, yeah, I don't have anything prepared as far as the presentation, but um, I'm really excited to hear positive feedback. Um, 
I hope that we can get everybody's support behind this project. Um, like Brian said, our community does have a relatively high percentage of families with special needs, uh, with the military base being an exceptional families base. Um, additionally, the school district, Oak Harbor School District, 20% of the students have some sort of disability, um, which is a high percentage. The national average for a school district is 15%, so we're above that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I personally have a child who um, has autism and he, there are things that just aren't safe at our current um, playgrounds for him and for his peers. Um, I, I hear from parents all the time, you know, they would love to see at least a fenced in park, um, but even more than that would be great. Um, and really, uh, Accessible spaces are really not about restricting anything. It's just kind of removing as many barriers as possible so that everybody has a chance to have fun and play and interact with their friends. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Council member Stuckey. This is for anyone, it isn't just necessarily for you. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> it's mod pizza night. Uh, no, just a couple of practical questions. Um, can you get some examples of what inclusive playground equipment looks like? I mean, it's easy to think of, oh, here's a chair, a wheelchair can, you know, here's a swing, a wheelchair can go in. But what's, what's some other examples of what inclusive playground equipment looks like? Yeah, so um, usually when people think handicap accessible, they think wheelchairs. Um, and that's a really a small percentage of what we're talking about when we're talking about disabilities. Um, like I say, we're trying to remove barriers. So examples would be um, mobility issues. There, there's a barrier in every one of our playgrounds with the wood chip surfacing. Um, the poured rubber surfacing would remove that barrier for those people. Um, Autism elopement is a is a big issue, a big concern for safety. So um, none of our playgrounds are fully fenced in. Having a fully fenced in playground would remove that barrier for those families. Um, kids with communication issues, um, they're either nonverbal or if they have hearing loss or any other speech or language disorder. Um, communication boards are something we can incorporate um, to help them communicate with anybody on the playground, whether they have a disability or not. Um, yeah, I mean, sensory issues is a big thing with a lot of kids. Uh, so, you know, equipment like uh, sensory stimulating equipment, but also um, equipment that provides sensory breaks for kids who get easily overstimulated, which is very common with a lot of our kids. Um, so, yeah, I don't know um, if there's any other <laughs> examples you're looking for. Okay. <laughs> it, and just a few uh, comments to that so um, yeah like Carrie said a lot of times uh, what cities will do is they'll just check off a box right so okay we put in a ramp in a handy in a handicap swing we're good it's an accessible playground what this is really looking at is what's called a universal design so it, it's truly inclusive every feature you look at is something that everyone can have an ability to play with so features like what's called a fun sway you, you go on and and um, you know, you have a little ramp that, that moves and goes like this. But like we mentioned, not the majority of uh, disabilities are not physical. They are uh, developmental and, and even social and different things like that. So things even like a communications board, which is basically uh, a picture with, a, you know, a, a word above where nonverbals can point and communicate to their, their friends, hey, I need to go use the restroom. Uh, something as simple as that, right? That absolutely changes the quality of life and their ability to to enjoy themselves by simply communicating a need um, you know being being thoughtful in the implementation of what are we putting there and how are people going to interact with it things like sometimes kids need a break from being overstimulated so you have these kind of like igloo sort of hideaways that provide both um, both uh, site simulation but also give a reprieve away from uh, all the noise and and just overstimulation to kind of have a quiet space as well. Um, so purposely designing in ways that that uh, that try to address all those variety of a spectrum of needs. What what sort of a ballpark time frame do we look at here? 
I, yeah, so, we will not quote you on it. Nope. Uh, so this, the pour in place has to be uh, put in above 40 degrees in relatively dry weather. So that gives us a window, unfortunately, during probably the busiest time in the, in the park, right, during the summer season. Uh, construction takes about a month. It's about three weeks or so for uh, the installation of the equipment and then about a week for the pour in place. And then you have a little bit of a buffer. Oh, okay. And then how does this, you know, we did the, the wind jammer survey and feedback and stuff, and it, admittedly this wasn't listed as one of the options. How do you feel that this fits into that feedback that we receive from the community? That's the next agenda item. We'll get into that. <laughs> Proceed. Proceed. Uh, no, um, I guess we'll get to that. Um, I, I just love the idea of how it was talking about all types of children, those especially needs, those without uh, age groups, teenagers and stuff like that, not just kids. And it, you know, having that place that's designated to be an accessible park, I mean, as a parent, it can sometimes be difficult if your child doesn't have a physical disability to kind of explain to other parents why awkward behavior is happening. And I feel like at a place like this, it'd be a, a little more accepting. So I'm obviously all for it. Um, but my main concern was how does it fit into the wind jammer plan? So. Yeah, so it was, um, like I mentioned, it was, it was included in the original planning effort and it was one of the top 10 things that are most important to you from the respondents. Uh, we had it in there in the, the top 10. It was number one, two, three, four, four, five. Five, playground on the west side of the park. Great, well, thank you. Look forward to it and thank you everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Stuckey. Councilmember Wigenstein. Yay. <laughs> Hoorah. The whole works. Um, it, this, this goes to being equitable in our community about everybody being out that has any kind of need to be able to kind of met with what they can have, right? So I'm, I'm totally on board. I'm super excited. Um, as we think in these, along these lines, the things that come up to me you answered the one question about, you know, assistance from our partners the Navy or somewhere along those lines and um, the other thing is is as we I know that this particular model would be a you know a designated park for the inclusion right um, as we re update the the other parks and we start to add new equipment and whatnot can we incorporate a portion of this same type of system into all of our parks eventually yeah and will our if we you know, this, as this feasibility study gets done with the rec center, um, I would encourage us to make sure we create space within that project as well for um, this inclusiveness. Yeah, we will systematically renovate every park space we have in our park system. Everyone will be an exciting, themed, clean, attractive space that's safe, uh, and each design will uh, be an inclusive design. Uh, they're not probably going to be at the scale that we're building this first one uh, since most of them are little neighborhood parks um, But yeah, I want families to go by and instead of looking at it like eh, that's a little sketchy over there of The kids say mom. We got to go there this weekend. Let's go. It's got a metal slide. Come on. Yeah. I mean Right, so yeah, thank you so much I, I love the 70s do want their slide back <laughs> Thank you councilmember Wigginstein councilmember Marshall. Thank you mayor Brian I I can't tell you how much I appreciate your passion and your leadership and your vision for something like this. And, and thank you, Carrie, for, for taking the lead on this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like my fellow council members, I'm very supportive of this idea. I think the more opportunities we can provide for all, all of the people in our community, you know, the better off we are. Unfortunately, I have to be that guy too, though, that, that I have to ask the, the money question, right? Is I was a little surprised to see that the, the funding or the price tag had jumped from a little bit what's in our, our packet. Um, you know, we're showing a 275 program match, but I believe the slide you showed was at 350. Is that program match, does that have to come from the city or can we use other federal partners? You know, if the state wanted to help contribute to that or the yeah. Navy wanted to contribute, or yeah. is it eligible for that? Yeah, uh, so we, we just met yesterday with um, one of our playground providers that uh, we worked very closely with and, and got dialed in numbers. That was based off of quotes, that, uh, the original was based off of quotes I had gotten uh, three years ago and, and just kind of adjusted. Um, so we wanted to make, but 
but they're pretty close to where we are expecting the total project to be. Okay. So the, the Land uh, Water Conservation Fund is uh, awarded in, is notified in October, and you can start the work in, I think, July? Is that, was that right? July. So we're not looking, we would not be able to start the project until next summer. Uh, so that gives us plenty of time to, to go after uh, um, uh, matched grant funding uh, in several different areas. And it's not a, it's not a huge amount. So I feel pretty confident uh, as we look at this. Obviously, um, like I mentioned before my my philosophy around it is for new infrastructure we try to to fund that as much through um, alternative revenue sources so yeah we'll look at every possibility that doesn't impact general fund and we have other options available anyway so so who's going to take the lead on the community donations portion of that yeah so all these playground providers uh help with um, outreach you know we'll have engagement with the community both into the design but also just about getting them excited around the project like i said this these are feel-good projects that are just really easy to get community um, neighborhoods and families and and organizations around uh, so we'll be working closely with the provider that the uh, contractor that um, we select to to host those and then you know whether it's we set up a website we'll go we'll go about it through a pretty systematic process that most uh, park donation uh, programs go through okay so this this won't theoretically impact the other park projects that are currently in the comprehensive no, plan or not okay. at all okay. capital improvement plan rather okay great I, I appreciate it thank you so much thank you councilmember marshall anyone else for the good of the order all right thank you very much the next topic is Windjammer Park financial and project update and presenting is Brian Smith. All right, um, so this makes a good segue into this. I was asked to just give an update on uh, Windjammer Park and where, we're, where we've been, where we're at, what's, uh, what's coming up. And we have a couple of uh, project items we'll be bringing to you recently. So this provides a good uh, discussion point for us to work through any concerns or questions you might have before we bring it back for an action item. Uh, so the, the city selected Woodjammer Park as the clean water facilities location. Um, the community had some strong feelings about that, and they, they wanted to have a little more input into uh, the process of the construction of both the facility and, and how it would impact the park, and then what improvements uh, would happen in the park as part of that project. So to uh, meet the community's request to keep park improvements money in the park, uh, funds were allocated to the capital improvements plan for uh, improvements to Windjammer Park. Uh, we did a community feedback uh, survey in 2022. Uh, some of the projects that were included part of that survey that the city had already identified that we wanted to work on and were working towards were things like uh, improving the kitchens and rental spaces, ADA access to uh, other non-path areas like the beach trip down to the beach, um, looking at native growth areas uh, around the beach and, and just making improvements to that waterfront, uh, replacing the irrigation system that was in dire need of replacing, uh, replacing the lagoon dock, and then also looking at improvements to the, the ramp for kayaks and other non-motorized vehicles. Um, Additionally, we had projects that were identified in the uh, original plan uh, that was brought to the community. And those had a, a, a few different amenities looking, looking at things like creating a great lawn space for special events, uh, wetlands enhancements next to the clean water facility with a, an outlook and some information signs, just talking about that process and all the amazing things that Public Works were doing. Uh, looking at improvements and additional picnic areas around the Lagoon and Splash Park. Uh, shoreline enhancements, uh, looking at a playground on the west side of the park, um, a dog run, and uh, dog, enclosed dog space where dogs could be off leash, and then some streetscapes improvements uh, along Beatsma Drive. Uh, so the community feedback, uh, they came back, they had uh, some top 10 things that they felt were really important, uh, including some of those projects I just listed. Uh, some of the things that had not been part of that additionally that came back were to bring back the windmill uh, that had been removed at the end of its life uh, having more city hosted special events more things for uh, teens and young adults to do down at the park um, there is uh, 
a desire to keep and improve the baseball fields, um, create more covered uh, areas, have barbecue grills, improve some of those picnic areas, uh, increase the maintenance uh, by the city of the park, making sure it's clean, well-groomed, just looking like a, a premier park as the face of the city um, down on the waterfront. Adding trees back into the park, especially shade and fragrance trees, uh, increasing plantings and, and flowers and just kind of beautifying the space, making it feel like a real well-maintained and manicured um, area. Having a dog park for off-leash dog uh, play, uh, lagoon improvements uh, that we've heard a bit about from the community recently. Um, we also had things that uh, respondents wanted to see that weren't included in some of our um, uh, listed priorities. Uh, those include things like RV and tent camping, um, added parking, improving restrooms, uh, additional playgrounds, uh, a recreation indoor uh, center space for kids uh, year round, uh, sports courts, volleyball and pickleball courts, um, making improvements to the splash park, uh, creating an amphitheater for uh, music and, and special events and shows, and then just um, adding to the walkways. Um, what we saw how people utilize the, the park, uh, number one thing was just to go down there, enjoy the space, enjoy the, the waterfront, walk through the park, watch all the kids playing, you know, meeting with friends and neighbors. Um, they just walk, walk. They like to walk their dogs. They like to bike. They like to jog through the space. So we took all this feedback. We had discussion with our Parks and Recreation Commission. They had uh, input as well. We had a couple of uh, necessity items that had happened uh, through different incidents uh, in last year. And so staff had a list of recommendations on priorities on where we wanted to get started. Um, <clears throat> and we had them listed there one through seven. We presented that to council last year. Uh, and based on, that was just based on, like I said, feedback. Um, we also had a uh, storm damage that eroded away some of the shoreline and was undermining our uh, main pathway through the park. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just give you an update on, on each of these. Some of these we've pivoted on, some of these are in process. So uh, number one, repair the shoreline. Uh, we're hunting for grant funding currently to uh, include the wind jammer erosion control in a larger shoreline restoration project. Uh, because the permitting for the shoreline work is a very long and expensive process, uh, for now the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, has given us the okay to keep um, our erosion control measures in place and we just have to monitor and replace them as needed uh, if they start to break down. Uh, we had set aside $47,000 from ARPA funds uh, to address that. Uh, we, we're kind of done with the, the erosion control for now. We'll have maybe some upkeep of that, but we have uh, those funds that can be redirected to other safety um, related projects. Uh, number two, the enhancement of the pavilion for um, events. The Arts Commission is looking at a future amphitheater project as was identified in the community feedback responses rather than improvements to the current pavilion, uh, which will address uh, the configuration and, and the um, alignment of it uh, to better suit uh, events in the evening time, uh, as well as have the, the hookups and needs and all, um, for music and different things like that. Uh, fix, fixing the splash park. Uh, so council last year approved the agreement with Vortex. We're currently working on uh, with an electrician on the install of those improvements. Uh, we anticipate we'll have the new system in place by season opening just before the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and that project was for $55,000. Uh, improving the picnic options and adding shelters, um, along with number five of rental facility improvements. Both of those, we're getting quotes currently and working on installing those these, this summer. Uh, shaded areas, we've had some discussion around that and uh, have been looking at pricing, uh, working with our uh, central services supervisor on that. We're doing tree plantings as well as researching the sh uh, shade structures and uh, we'll be doing that work uh, this year as well. Uh, the interpretive center um, improvements and availability for use. So we started programming the interpretive center uh, to pilot public use of the space. Um, we're looking and we'll have some discussions around bringing on an architect this fall for additional egress and security, emergency door changes uh, in prep for being able to uh, more 
utilize the space for the public, renting out the space. Um, it is a beautiful space and it's been great with our recreation programs that we just started this year. Um, so we refined these recommendations and prioritized uh, and impl are implementing the projects uh, from the community feedback as well as, as those recommendations. Uh, some of the things uh, for you to be aware of that are currently in process that are coming to you. Um, one is the, the ball fields. Uh, we have we have uh, some safety issues there uh, with lips. Those have kind of long been needed to be renovated. Um, we had the Little League come to us about a year ago um, wanting to do about a $40,000 uh, improvement to the infields, went and evaluated the fields, identify all the different needs, uh, and really the whole place needs a good renovation. Uh, we went and got quotes that ended up being more into the $80,000 or so. Uh, so we realized that that needed to be a formal bid process and went through that process um, identifying scope. Uh, we got um, uh, estimates for that at about $160,000 total. Um, that originally had been broken up into two phases. One was the infield um, for about uh, a little I want to say a little over $100,000, or maybe that one was a little under $100,000. And then um, the phase two, which we were going after the local parks maintenance grant uh, with RCO for about um, $100,000 for a total of um, close to about $200,000 uh, for all the improvements, um, replacing the dugouts, um, improving fencing, uh, doing the infields, the the warning tracks and all that kind of stuff. So um, we were right at the cutoff with that grant. We, we were like number 41 of 40 that were awarded. If, uh, if someone doesn't end up doing their project, um, we're next in line to, to get that. But I know RCO is looking at doing that, uh, that grant program again this year. So we'll go after those grant funds um, if we can. And uh, um, we are going ahead and go forward with uh, at least taking care of the majority of those projects. Uh, so that's coming to council in a future uh, council meeting and we've added on some of the, some of the uh, phase two items to that scope uh, as requested by the, the Little League. Uh, the Lagoon Dock, so right now we're kind of in um, permitting hell with that a little bit. Uh, we have gone through uh, two years of, of going through the permitting process. Our engineering department has been very gracious to help us slog through that. Uh, we are anticipating about another year before that f gets all finalized. Um, I, I will point out that this is unfortunately, this project just as a whole, unfortunately is a great example of what happens when um, when we dive into a project without planning first. So uh, I, I have the, the privilege of um, serving on the Washington State uh, Parks and Recreation Board as the Northwest Regional Director. And we are uh, helping communities that don't have the resources uh, to do planning projects, to implement strategic plans with technical assistance program. Uh, the reason we do that, that and what we're seeing is, is that uh, communities that don't have a good strategic plan for these projects end up being reactionary to uh, solutions looking for a problem. And uh, that's kind of how this project came about. We had a, a grant that was available. We looked for a project to match it. Um, and we went forward and, and did the purchase of a dock to replace the current dock. There's a lot of questions that weren't asked, let alone answered, uh, before we jumped into that. Uh, one of them, this project replaces the existing um, pylon dock with a floating dock. Uh, that creates a situation that's a little concerning about a floating dock in dark water and, and safety issues with en entrapment and things like that that we'll want to look very carefully at. Um, it, does, it does help a lot of the ecology uh, concerns with the current dock, with light infiltration, with the new easy dock, but we also want to make sure that the dock is um, going to be robust enough that we're not going to have to go through this process all over again if we need to replace it down the line. So, um, so we're going to... Uh, evaluate the, the dock. We want to know what the real life expectancy is of it. Understand better what permitting might be need to continue maintenance of that and, and um, just the cost benefit of if we continue on with this project, which is the direction that we are going, um, 
versus if we step back and go in a different direction with uh, doing renovations of the current dock. So we'll bring that back to you when we have a little more information and have made a good evaluation of, of that. But um, as you've heard from the community, there's a lot of, um, the lagoon is very popular in the summertime. Uh, we have a lot of uh, ideas and comments and suggestions for improvements, uh, especially around accessibility uh, into the lagoon. And we wanna make sure that we address those. It'll probably be separate from this project, but things that would fit within that uh, Windjammer Park Improvement Fund. Uh, an inclusive playground, so just touched on that and don't need to rehash the whole thing, but Oak Harbor, uh, uh, I think needs this, uh, needs this amenity uh, to happen. And um, we are looking at the west side of, of Windjammer Park. We're bringing a uh, grant request at the next council meeting for a uh, land water conservation fund grant for $700,000 um, to go forward with this project and uh, we will have more discussion on that as well. So uh, the current financials for Windjammer uh, Improvement Fund, uh, we have, which is Fund 325, uh, we have an estimated availability of $1,067,000 uh, in 2024. Um, we'll have in the six year uh, capital improvement plan in the year 2027, we have an additional $200,000. $50,000 uh, that go into the, the fund project, providing us with a total of uh, $1.37 uh, million for the, the budget improvement projects. Um, we have since 2021, as we entered what is known as phase two of the pro project, uh, we spent uh, 151636 um, We have approximately 50000 that is uh, currently being processed for the Splash Park improvements, uh, bringing the available balance to just a little over $1 million. Uh, happy to answer any questions or any discussion that you'd like to have around these projects or uh, suggestions for um, inclusion with, with uh, what was included in the feedback. All right, thank you, Brian. With that, I will turn it over to Council for questions or comments. Yes, Council Member Stuckey. I know it's not in our control, <clears throat> but I constantly get questions about the windmill. What do we need to do to finally get more firm updates about the windmill from the Rotary Club? <laughs> I just emailed Brian Jones this morning again about that. Um, the last I had heard, and this was a few months ago, uh, they were about to get architectural drawings back and um, haven't gotten an update update since I, I try not to pester Brian Jones too much on it. I'm checking in with him about once a month, uh, trying to get an update for our, our commissions on it. But you know, the, uh, this is a, you know, important issue. Uh, the Rotary Club has been amazing with, uh, trying to get community support around it. We did identify it as a, um, one of the things that was important to the community to bring back the windmill. Uh, the city has contributed about $60,000 or so to the, the project uh, that came out of the arts fund. Um, I think we've, we've done our part and, and you know, we're doing whatever we can to support them in, in the development of it. And then the dock, I mean, that's it's kind of disappointing. You were not here when we made the first go ahead on that. Maybe we would have had a different perspective. Uh, one, are we gonna lose that T-Mobile grant? No, uh, in fact, it's already implemented and spent. So we have paid Evans Marine Solutions uh, for the dock, for the demo of the current dock and the installation of the new dock. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but did we not just either last me or the me before approve an extension to summer to have that dock replaced? Has, have, this permitting thing, has that come up since then? We extended their agreement, right? Um, for that work and and yeah the permitting is kind of ongoing we at the time when we uh, extended it out six months and we had already extended it before then um, were anticipating we were going to be able to do the work this this spring uh, before Memorial Day uh, I thought we were at the end of it but fish our uh, Army Corps of Engineers did come back with uh, some additional requirements with uh, 
Endangered Species Act, as well as the, um, uh, they love big acronyms, but um, another one that has to do with um, ecology, basically. Uh, so we met uh, with uh, Dennis and, and Gideon this morning to talk about that in the path forward. Uh, we're having a, a meeting with um, uh, Aquatic Marine Solutions uh, tomorrow, and um, we'll kind of have a scope for them in, in how we go forward in addressing this. But yeah, since since we did that extension, we've we've gotten feedback of you know there's still some more check boxes we have to meet. So this is us dealing with other agencies. This is not the CMO Carver dragging their feet. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, just obviously we are where we are, but the optics of it aren't great when we say, oh, this summer. No, well, but for sure this next next summer, and we may be saying now next summer again. I mean, it is what it is, but a little bit of egg on our face with this one, unfortunately. I'm so. as about as anti-bureaucracy as you can get. And um, yeah, you know, anything we do near the shoreline is just a involved process and, and it's kind of out of our hands a little bit. Um, Dennis was actually fairly optimistic. We talked this morning and said, oh, yeah, a couple of years, you know, anything that's involving Army Corps and fish and wildlife, you know, that's, that's what you can expect. So I, I think we, um, yeah, like I said, we probably could have been a little more evaluative in um, this project before we jumped in and really had a good uh, roadmap for what would be required and, and understand any additional costs. Um, the permitting really isn't that expensive. It's just engineering allocation. Sure. But. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Stuckey. Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Wiesner. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and thanks for that presentation, Brian. And uh, yeah, I guess we're just got to learn anytime we want to touch uh, the water on our waterfront that uh, it's going to be a long process. Although you, you've got to admit it's a little bit ridiculous for this size of dock and replacing an existing dock in a in a man-made body of water. Right. Right. And and so you know, just let us know if there's anything on the. You know, political front we can do. I mean, obviously there there does reach a time if 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 uh, we need to reach out to our allies down in Olympia or something and and start having that conversation. Obviously, we don't want to have to do that for every project. But uh, if if you just reach to the point where you have no hair left, just uh, let us know. And uh, just a just a quick a quick update of what I know uh, on on the windmill project. There is a uh, uh, we're working on putting together. Uh, uh, you know the first planning meeting for the year quite frankly the the winter has been kind of a little bit of a time off for some of those guys uh, I know they are working on the architectural drawings and uh, uh, there is conversation about uh, community engagement we realize Hall and Happenings coming up for the July is coming up and and certainly it's the intention to continue the community engagement through the Rotary Club and through the volunteers to to be at those events uh, uh, inform the community about uh, uh, those plans as well as continue fundraising. Um, uh, last I heard, I, I think we're just a little bit shy of halfway to where we need to be. Uh, we continue to get uh, support from the type of folks we know. I know I, uh, the owners of Blue Mountain Electric, I spoke with them recently and, and they're going to help us out with some of the electrical and stuff like that. And so we're continuing to garner that uh, contractor support that's going to be necessary to, to have uh, so once the project starts uh, we can you know, roll through it, but uh, uh, that's what I know. So there's a, a little bit going on. There's been recent discussion, and, and uh, I know there was some scheduling conflicts uh, for the last date we were working on for the meeting. You were in D.C. and and I was somewhere, and somebody else was somewhere, and, and it just. Uh, but uh, that's where we're heading, and uh, uh, certainly it is. Uh, you know, back to that uh, time of the year where you can get out in the community and have a have a way to engage the community. Uh, uh, not much you can do in December and January around here, but uh, yeah, and I appreciate the update. I mean, you get it. This is our jewel. This is the Oak Harbor. Uh, this is our bay. This is our harbor. This is this is what it's all about, and this is uh, for our community a, a very important thing as to how we utilize this space moving forward and and and, and make it a facility we can all be proud of. And and I know that uh, you know based upon your track record and the conversations you and I have had, you've got the same goals as we do to, 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 to get to there. So, um, you know, get, keep us informed and if something we can do up here, I, I think uh, you've got that universal support. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that update, thank you. Uh, I'll just very briefly add, um, you know, we have more, more 
things that we want to do that we probably have funding for. So we really are trying to use this fund as a leverage and going after alternative funding with different grants like the, the LWCF for the playground, the, um, the local park maintenance for the ball fields, you know, different things like that. So we're really going to stretch this out as much as we can. Yeah, let's try to turn that million dollars into $10 million. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Wiesner. Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Brian. Um, I, I guess the, the feedback I get the most from the community is they'd love to see us be able to have the, the carnival at Windjammer Park mm -hmm. again at some point. Um, is that, with, with all these plans, is that something that, that's feasible in the future, or are we just... Yep, we've already uh, had those meetings and are planning to have the carnival uh, for the 4th of July there at Woodjammer Park. Awesome. We did some evaluation of locations and um, just so we don't completely destroy the irrigation system, we're going to make pretty liberal use of some of the, the parking areas. So we'll have to get creative on how, uh, on how we do parking and bring people into the park. But the carnival and fireworks will all be out of the park this year. Great. Thank you. So sorry to jump in there, Brian. Um, I've had some conversations with the Chamber of Commerce and they're looking at other locations that they can do it at because there were some concerns with that location mm -hmm. was the last we heard. Mm -hmm. So they are working through that. It would still be in that area of downtown, but not um, necessarily at the park. Mm -hmm. So they were working on that last I heard. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you, Brian, for your presentation. Thank you, Council. We will move on to development services, planning commission annual report to city council. Pre uh, inter uh, sorry. Presenting will be director David Cool on that. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, today we'd like to talk about the development services planning commission annual report. So I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, but our code requires the Planning Commission to report out every February of every year. So we have been doing that recently and, and now we're going to start trying to get this in front of you uh, in March. So the staff report itself that you have in your packet uh, has a review of all the accomplishments in 2023. It also goes into a review of new projects that are coming up in 2024. There are recommendations from the Planning Commission and we've always had that reserved for the Planning Commission, but they've never <coughs> taken advantage of it till this year. So the two comments you have in there are uh, new, and so the Planning Commission has given us uh, some ideas of feedback. And at the very end of the report, there's a section that has each meeting with every vote. So that's just something for you to take with you in case you need to refer to it some other day. So the Planning Commission accomplishments, as you know, they're all long range planning now. It's all legislative action. In the past, the Planning Commission took care of conditional use permits. They looked at subdivisions. They did all kinds of different things, but that all went to the hearing examiner in late 2019. So since that time, they've just been a legislative body that acts on ordinances. And what a great job really to have where you get to create laws so that's a perfect job for a commission. So the big thing that they worked on so far last year and is still going forward this year is the 2023 comprehensive plan docket. And that includes the capital improvements plan as well as the implementation of the housing action plan. It also talks about the ATP, which you will see next uh, from CAC. And it goes into the downtown and marina expansion study among a number of other things. So that's been a big thing that the Planning Commission did get accomplished. We have three ordinances that we got through last year. Uh, OMC Chapter 1920, that was the open space district. We fixed a few items in that particular section of code. The next one is the thresholds for uh, categorical exemptions. That is your SEPA documents. So as you recall, uh, you saw this as well last year. Uh, the SEPA documents were way too restrictive had way too high a thresholds, and in state law it was changed 10 years ago. So we finally caught up and we loosened up on our regulations so you don't have to go through quite so much uh, regulation in order to uh, get through a process. The last one is uh, building plan check, where last year you saw this as well, and it was where we have plan check fees that were being collected at building permit, 
and really everywhere else in the state you can collect the plan check fee when you submit your application for plan check and so you you agreed with that uh, recommendation and we move that forward so actually we had a lot more work we did last year uh, that doesn't show here but a lot of it rolled over into january of this year so you'll see it uh, in our report next time Ongoing projects we have, the comprehensive plan update. CAC is here to talk about that a little bit uh, in the future. Uh, implementing the housing action plan is also ongoing. Dennis Lefevre works on the stormwater planning and that's cleaning up the stormwater. Uh, NIPTES is National uh, Pollution Discharge Elimination System. We have on there the fourth bullet, shoreline restoration. And we don't have funding for that, but a shoreline uh, planning effort is something that we'd like to get started. And the flood control ordinance. Uh, that's been in, uh, in a holding pattern for a while now. Uh, we've gotten through the Department of Ecology, so we thought we were ready to go, but then FEMA wanted to look at it. And so it's held up in FEMA right now. New projects, uh, as you know, housing, we've been talking about density for quite a while and the multifamily tax exemption. We'd like to come back and look at our land use uh, fee schedule and clean that up a little bit. Uh, fourth bullet down, we wanna talk about temporary use of RVs on construction sites. We have a developer who would like to put in RVs on his construction site. Uh, he can't find housing for his workers. Uh, he's having a hard time finding workers anyway, uh, but he's trying to relocate people from out of state and so this is a concept that he would like to explore. Upcoming is the 24-25 comp plan, and we'll be coming back to you on April 2nd with a contract uh, for a firm to help us with that. As you know, on the 23rd of April, we're all going to meet with the county and talk about uh, interlocal agreements and how to work together. And it'll be a land use type summit, a chance for us to sit down finally with the county and have a conversation about expanding our growth boundary. So that's uh, one of the main uh, pieces on the agenda. Active transportation plan, you'll see that next, uh, here in a few minutes. Alternate, alternate street connection plan is another topic we'll explore. Serendipity Lane, that's going on now. And uh, as you all know, the central development area was number one on your priority list to uh, approach this coming year. And within that is the vision to action plan uh, by the Center for Creative Recycling, another consultant, as well as a downtown waterfront planning effort by a company called Dolan Group. So you'll see those three items in, on May 21st. Whoops. So these are the commission recommendations that they had. Uh, the first one is housing. And I can really summarize it to just say they have a sense of urgency about getting some affordable housing started in town. Uh, that's really the summary. They didn't have solutions or uh, uh, anything in mind for us to pursue, but they would like us to focus on that. So that's certainly something that's ongoing and we'll continue to do that. Sustainability, that was something new. Uh, Commissioner Plumley uh, recommended that. And so if you ask 10 different people you'll get 10 different answers on what sustainable really means. So it's, it's really a question as to how you want to define it. And we'll have a chance to work on this this year because the climate change element will touch on that. And we have uh, good funding for that process coming up over the 24-25 calendar year. So that's our presentation on the Planning Commission. And I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about the Development Services Report. Thank you, David. Any questions or comments from council? Yes, council member Wiesner. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, just a quick comment. You know, when I first came on council, the, the normal phone call I would, I would get in the real estate business from an out of area developer was, you know, what's going on with the city of Oak Harbor? I just met with them and they gave me all the reasons why I can't do what I want to do, yet I'm doing that in, in other communities. And, and that was, I think, something we, we all often heard. And yesterday I had a two and a half hour conversation with a, regional developer thinking about coming to, to Oak Harbor and, and uh, it was a great conversation and in that conversation um, they led with how happy they were with the conversations with the planners. They specifically men mentioned Ray, but I, Ray Lindenberg, but I know the, the rest of the planners do a great job down there and, and how positive and upbeat the conversation was. 
and how they uh, left the office feeling as though the city of Oak Harbor was somebody they could partner with uh, in, in bringing uh, sustainable, affordable housing to the community. That's what they specialize in. And so I just want to hand it to you, Mr. Cool, and, and the rest of your apartment for, for a little bit of a turnaround there, right? Uh, we're, we're not focusing on the reasons we can't do something. We're looking for the reasons and the ways we can. And, and, and uh, you know, I know, I, I know that's just an entire change and, and shift of thinking about, you know, how governments operate, right? Because for the longest time, it was our job to regulate, and, and, and that became somewhat over-regulation. Right, and and I think we're all learning more and more that the the economy and, and the region and the, the public that's what we need to listen to, and that's what needs to speak to us rather than, than the regulations. And and we need to figure out ways to yes, that's how we're going to solve these problems. We're not going to we're not going to solve affordable housing and sustainable housing with no's. Um, so. Uh, I just wanted to relay that to you. It was a fantastic, like I say, two and a half hour conversation. Person I talked was talking to a very high level person that you know has worked with many communities, and so um, you know take that back to your staff. Uh, it's a it's a huge compliment. It was something I was very proud of in, in, in you know, when having that conversation. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councilmember Wiesner. Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Stuckey. I mentioned this before. Uh, when we met, looking just at the last couple of years, I feel that the turnover of the Planning Commission is higher than any other commission. I, I, I'm sure I could have pulled the numbers. I'm probably right. I would think so. Um, it is a very difficult commission, much more difficult than others as far as terms of knowledge of what you have to have. I acknowledge that. But do you have any ideas to help with retention? I mean, we were getting a lot of, the, I mean, some of it just happens naturally, attrition, people move. I get that. I'm talking about the people who join for 10 months, not, hey, not for me, gone. Join for six months, hey, not for me, because you really need a year or two. I mean, I was on it for 10 months, and I was just getting to a point where I'm like, I kind of know what I'm doing. So any thoughts on retention or recruitment? Uh, no thoughts really on recruitment. Uh, we've been successful recently uh, since our last meeting before last night. We had two people move on to other jobs, and we've got them ready to be replaced on April 2nd. So that was a fairly quick turnaround to get it uh, to get replacement. As far as retaining uh, commission members, uh, what we're trying to do is keep them engaged. And I think maybe me a little more effort in on my part as well as as our staff to get them involved in um, working on projects perhaps subcommittees or something like that. Uh, we have upcoming big projects, the comp plan, so we want to get one of them involved in a steering committee for the comprehensive plan. Another concept is to develop a steering committee uh, with, with approval of the council uh, for economic development. And so there's a couple of specialized areas that a couple of them could get involved in. We're not sure how much time each of them have to work outside the planning commission. Uh, we're going to start bringing some topics in front of them to start exploring. And so they can spend time just like in a workshop format. Uh, food trucks is one issue we're going to start talking about. That seems to have the attention of the public right now. And a number of other things. Uh, because our comp plan is coming up, there's a ton of things that we're going to start talking about. And so I'm sure CAC and, and the team will be bringing back a lot of interesting topics in front of the Planning Commission and engaging with them on that kind of, on that level. Yeah, I think just my opinion, I think that tangibility is key. I mean, you think of something like the park sport. They're working on a playground. That playground happens and they can say, I help with that playground. It's a little more, I don't want to use this term, it's not as sexy, but you know, a, a code amendment isn't as tangible. You know, it's kind of harder to see an end result necessarily. So anything we can do to keep them engaged, I'm all for. I mean, it's, their feedback is valued. I just want to make sure we, that they know that and they have reasons to continue. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Stuckey. Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, David. I, I had a question on the vision to action plan the Center for Creative Recycling. What, what exactly does that mean? Uh, that's a, a nonprofit uh, that is uh, based in Oregon. And Steve Schuler and I are working on bringing them in to help do a feasibility analysis 
a fiscal feasibility analysis of what can work downtown and spread that to the CDA area. Uh, they'll also do some design work and it'll be part of the EPA grant that Steve is working on uh, for the two lots that we own downtown. Gotcha. Uh, so interestingly enough, the EPA is incentivizing uh, a nonprofit to come in and help cities actually develop properties after they're cleaned up. And so instead of coming in in the old days, you would come in and you'd get these grants and you'd clean up property and then it would sit there and nothing would happen. They've realized that they need to do some land use planning on top of that. And that's what this uh, clear vision to action will do is help us get to a place of planning, looking at a feasibility analysis. So it doesn't help us to say, yeah, we'd love to have these fancy buildings downtown and not have the feasibility analysis to know if it can work. And so they're gonna help us analyze that. It's also part of the Dolan group uh, that Steve will be coming back on May 21st uh, with contract to talk about continuing with imaging and the design of the buildings downtown. Okay, sounds good, thank you. And then I, I had a question on this recommendation. So you, you mentioned uh, Commissioner Plumlee's had the sustainability thing. What was his definition of sustainability? Because I, I did question some of the com the Planning Commission members as to what exactly that meant, because it seems pretty vague, and, and they weren't entirely sure what that what how to interpret that. So, good question. Uh, sustainability can mean a lot of different things. It can mean planting trees in the Amazon. It can mean getting a calculator to calculate carbon recapture. It can mean doing incentivized programs locally so that you produce uh, farm-based goods on the island. Uh, all of that is sustainability. I don't know exactly where Commissioner Plumley wanted to go with it. He did mention that he has a master's degree in that field, uh, which I was not aware of. So we can ask him more questions about what he has in mind and before we go any further with it. Thank you, Councilmember Marshall. Is that it? Anything else for the good of the order? All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Cool. We thank will you. move on to the next subject of countywide planning policy. And here to present is CAC Kamak. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm here to kind of touch base with the Council at the workshop on the countywide planning policies. I know the City Council is familiar with this topic, but as we're getting closer to adopting a new set of policies, that will touch base here and answer any questions or concerns that the, that the Council may have before we bring it to action next month. I have a short presentation to just recap some of the things that we did with this project and, uh, and then open it up for discussion. So uh, as the council is aware, the countywide planning policies, they're also known as an acronym CWPP and CPP. I just wanted to make sure that they refer to the same thing. And it's a requirement of the Growth Management Act. And the primary uh, intent of these countywide planning policies is to bring consistency in planning efforts with all the agencies and jurisdictions within a certain county. So, uh, Island County has had countywide planning policies since GMA went in place in the early uh, 1990s. And so we have, uh, as a city um, uh, and the county, uh, looked into these policies and amended them over time based on the different demands and needs uh, that each community has. And so currently, with the comprehensive plan update, the major update that the state is requiring, uh, we are all um, on the same boat in terms of trying to look at these policies to make sure that they reflect uh, what we're trying to do. So uh, this has been a topic for discussion with the council and the planning commission since last October. We had that joint workshop. This was one of the primary topics. We discussed um, some of these um, tools and amendments at the January 16th meeting. We um, had the Planning Commission look at the 20-year population projection. That's kind of part of this uh, whole process is to make sure that all jurisdictions in Island County agree on what population we're planning for. So that's just a consistency number. The Planning Commission looked at it uh, in January, and the City Council actually ratified 
the uh, island county's decision on the population uh, um, at its February 5th meeting. So this is just a follow-up action on that. Uh, this is all the policies in the, com in the countywide planning policies. And um, the housing allocation tool that we discussed in, on January 16th, the allocation of 5,000 plus units to Oak Harbor, uh, that all comes uh, with this countywide planning policy. So um, how did we go about doing this? There was a group of uh, planning level uh, staff in each jurisdiction that uh, was formed what's called the planning, countywide planning group. This is a uh, section of requirement of the countywide planning policies to form this group in order to look at amendments. They started meeting about six to eight months ago uh, in approaching this uh, comprehensive plan update and knew that we needed to make some amendments. And uh, there was an overall structure that we all agreed in terms of moving forward. And, and I've just listed um, some of those things that we considered. We wanted to be consistent. Uh, that's what uh, most of the amendments, if you look at it, there's a strikeout version in your packet. Um, it's to try and bring the terminology up to speed uh, in line with state uh, terminology, in line with county and city plans. Uh, we also looked at practical growth-related modifications. We uh, suspected that there's a possibility that there will be uh, cases made to expand UGAs during this, uh, this uh, 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 amendment process, so we wanted to make sure that it was practical. Um, we wanted to definitely look at the GMA's uh, kind of primary principle in terms of trying to direct more growth in urban areas and keeping the rural areas as rural as possible. I think that's one of GMA's main intent, and we tried to make sure that we capture that in uh, the efforts. And we also knew that um, a lot of these challenges are new uh, to the country and to the state and to the cities. And we have to learn as we go. We have to take some steps in some direction and see how that goes, and we'll have to make further modifications as we go. And that's why we have this update cycle of about eight to 10 years for the comprehensive plan, or whether it's uh, housing uh, allocations, we have to look at them periodically to make sure we make these adjustments. And so there's this learn on the move uh, philosophy of trying to not find the solution, because it, we may never do, uh, because sometimes it's a moving target. So uh, with that philosophy, the group uh, tackled most of the, uh, uh, the amendments that are being put forward. Uh, the scope of the amendments, if I could summarize them, they are clerical and terminology update, again, for consistency purposes. There were some policy modifications to make sure that cities or jurisdictions can uh, include natural areas um, in the growth pattern as a way of incorporating natural elements into the urban area. Um, there was a look at the housing tool and uh, that the state has provided and which determines the housing allocation. That was included in the, in the policies and a appendix was created to show how uh, the tool was created and how the allocations were done. So this is all included in the amended document. So uh, highlights again, uh, the county uh, adopted the median population of 102,639. City Council ratified it in February. And we're gonna do that with the housing allocation with the countywide planning policies. Island County will adopt it and we'll have to ratify it. I got an email yesterday that the Island County Commissioners considered this at their meeting yesterday and they did approve it. They had some minor modifications, but I think it was clerical. So they did approve it, so we'll be bringing this forward to the City Council to ratify in April. And once the jurisdictions have ratified it, we have a working document and we can get our consultants to start working on the buildable lands analysis and all the processes that are contained within. So timing-wise, this is lining up very well. So uh, what is the, uh, uh, one of the biggest changes in that uh, um, Oak Harbor should be aware of in this uh, amendment is this housing action uh, planning tool. And um, this is where, uh, you know, we select the population. Again, that's the agreed population of 102,639. This is, you plug it into the spreadsheet, 
and the spreadsheet puts out the total number of housing units that Island County has to plan for over the next 20 years, and that's 8,717. And the jurisdictions will then have to uh, look at how to assign them to the various jurisdictions, and that is this yellow, or, uh, sorry, the blue box uh, on the left-hand side, and those are the percentages, and that's what the countywide planning group worked on, and this is the recommendation that comes from that group in terms of allocation. So the 5,533 units is not uh, limited to Oak Harbor City limits. It's, the, it's a very important distinction. It applies to the city limits and the UGA. So there'll be a certain amount of population or a certain amount of housing units that we can accommodate within the city limits of those 5,000. And we'll use our consultants to do the analysis and determine how much that is. Whatever we can accommodate in, in the city limits will be, have to be accommodated in the UGA. So we'll have to do a calculation to see if we can accommodate in the UGA. And if we can't, then that means we have to expand our UGA. I think that's kind of the steps we see uh, working out uh, as we start this process. So this is what kind of lays the foundation for a lot of that work. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll be bringing it to the April 16th meeting, I believe, uh, for your ratification. So with that, I will open it up for any discussion, comments, or questions that the council may have. Thank you, CAC. Any questions or comments from council? Yes, Councilmember Wiesner. Thanks for that presentation again, CAC. I got to see it last night. You, you got it spot on. Um, so I, I guess my concern, and I, and I think it was a concern of the Planning Commission, came up last night, and, and, and I know it's a concern of yours, and, and, and it's obviously the point we need to discuss is, you know, how do we drive this below 80% median income, you know, 3,200 roughly houses here, over half of the, the new houses that we're expected to, to see in the city over the next 20 years can be less than 80% of median income. Um, and so I guess just as an exercise, and, 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 and uh, you know, we've got a lot of housing projects kind of out there right now. I mean, last I, I counted, I think there's close to 900 you know, if every project we had came to fruition and the houses were built, which is huge, right? We're doing something right, right? Um, out of those 900 that were grown organically with our current codes and stuff, be curious to know how many of those projects are going to end up in this less than 80% median income, right? And this may be a conversation we can start having with some of those developers as to what price points uh, they're building out at. You know, we've got the project on Northeast 10th, which I, I think is getting ready to clear, and uh, the project on uh, Crosby uh, uh, that we're site planning. And, and some of those uh, developers maybe, maybe get an idea of what price point they're looking at. And I'd be interested to know how many of the houses of those 900 are, are organically ending up in that category. I, I think that would give us an indication of how much work we've got ahead of us, right? If organically we are already creating some housing Although that, and I'd be surprised if that was the case, quite frankly. Yeah. But if organically we were creating some of that, obviously we have less work ahead of us than, than if none or very few of those were in that category. That, that then becomes our big challenge, right? It's not a challenge of figuring out where to put this housing, but how do we get it to, to, to drive to these matrices? So um, uh, just, just a thought, I, I think we, knowing that information as we get into this, I think would be a valuable tool for, for knowing how much work we got ahead. Absolutely, um, it is, it's gonna be challenging and that's one of the learn on the move goes. Um, I would doubt uh, if, um, a, you know, uh, if I can assign any percentage to the existing stock that we have in the pipeline for affordability. I think the incentive is not there and therefore organically grown kind of developments will try and meet market rate, I think, unless they are incentivized to do so or unless there's a very specific project to do so. At least that's kind of the outlook that we all have it's in, in terms of currently the practical way of looking at it. So it is going to be a challenge when we have to uh, look for solutions or look for ways uh, in which we can incorporate uh, affordability into the growth over the next 20 years. And I think that's where the challenge is, and I think that's where the consultants are there to help us with options and choices um, and what kind of development codes, what kind of incentives. Uh, we'll be looking at densities. Density is going to be a big topic 
in our comprehensive plan discussion, we'll be thinking about uh, you know, a higher ceiling for densities or maybe even taking out density caps. All kind of, all tools are on the table in order to try and open up the options uh, so that maybe with organic development we do get affordability, right? I mean, so that's, that's all part of the choices that I think we'll have over the next few months. Uh, and it's going to be a big change. This is an exciting time. There's a lot of demand for affordable housing. There's a lot of demand for density, uh, to increase density. And then we have the comp plan and, and, a, and a vision in terms of how we can shape all of this uh, for Oak Harbor over the next 20 years. So the next six months is going to be fairly exciting. I feel like I'll be here almost in every workshop trying to give you an update of where the comprehensive plans are. I'll try and keep you up to date on all the challenges that we have and try and get as much feedback from you as we go forward uh, in terms of what your thoughts are in terms of how this can happen. So we'll all be part of that. We don't, none, none of the communities that I know have solutions is mostly affordability is, going, is mainly through grant programs and, and state funded um, venues and routes where the money is coming from. So um, not sure how it is going to transfer organically to the, just the market uh, development. Yeah, and I appreciate all those thoughts. And, and yeah, it's gonna be challenging for us as a small community with not big pockets to, to totally take something that hasn't happened organically or, or a very small percentage and flip that, right? Because again, we're, we're talking about 60% or 65% going from maybe 5% to 65%. And, 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 and uh, you know, we, we can't wait till the year 20 to do it. We've got to plan for it in the next, we, we got six months to a year to figure it out, right? And, and uh, you know, to date, of course, a developer comes to town and we tell them, this is what your development has to look like. And, and uh, part of that is obviously how we keep our city coins and et cetera. So we're, we're still gonna have to have some of those requirements, but you're right, you know, when it comes to density and, and what will people buy, you know, I mean, would you have ever thought somebody would buy a, you know, 600 square foot cottage a few years ago, you know, uh, the, the tiny home craze, would you have ever thought that would have caught on, the container craze, would, would you ever thought that would have caught on, you know, and, and so we are going to have to be visionaries up here, all of us, and we're going to be relying heavily upon you for for some of those ideas, and then, then obviously we're going to be turning to that development community to accept and adopt those changes we make, and then come here and develop those projects that we never thought we would ever see, but then make sure we're keeping those uh, with the tones that we want for our community. So some big challenges. It is, and and I will um, make a um, a kind of a lead in thought about the MFT program that has come in front of city council. I think council uh, wanted to delay that conversation until they had a little more information on how to tackle that. And that's a community supported program of sorts, if you look at it. Um, and I think we'll have a chance to kind of look into it a little closer, but those MFTE tools are critical to consider uh, for Oak Harbor because that gives a place where you can have these uh, programs targeted. And so then that way we can know where to have these areas and how to, how to get more housing and then how to develop networks and transportation networks around that. So uh, there, there are tools and there are opportunities. We just have to be open to look at them and see what's best for the community as we go forward. Council Member Hoffmeyer. I was glad you mentioned that MFT. Yeah, that's something I was hoping to look at again. You know, uh, it, it probably is going to be, you know, almost an all-hands approach getting to that number that we need to get to. Um, you know, with, with, with economic development, for instance, you might have a, a government entity or a, mun a municipality in, invest in infrastructure for a... Uh, for an industrial park, if you will, with roads and parking and, you know, slabs that are ready to go, if you will, with utilities. Um, you know, that might be part of the answer with the, the answer to affordable housing as well as it, there's probably going to be a point to where we have to figure out a way to pitch in some infrastructure. So ju just some thoughts, but I think that MFT is, is part of the conversation for sure. So thank you. Councilmember Arms. Well, I think part 
of the problem here is that we're used to having bigger houses. In the Midwest, we're not. You know, if your house was a little over 900 square feet, you were happy. And I think that we have a mindset that we're entitled to have all this big. And we haven't properly introduced people that it is functional. You can have a three bedroom, one bath, nine under a thousand square foot house and still have a doable house. We don't, we think that, you know, you've got two kids, two adults, that's not enough space. But we've never, we've never encouraged small. We have continued to encourage big. And I think in, until we show people what a tiny house looks like, what's doable and what you can do, it's gonna be hard to convince people to change. I mean, I'm from the Midwest, we lived in the Midwest, and that's what we had, and we were perfectly happy. So, you know, we think we have the palace with more square foot each year, but I think that's part of our problem, is we just think that we've got this big, and we need to remind people that small's okay. It works for a lot of reasons. Your, your heating, your, your everything involved is less, with less. And I think that, you know, I think we need to encourage people to do that. That it, it's doable and it's lovely and it's, you know, it's awesome. Instead of looking like, is that all you can afford? And I think that is one of the big problems here in the, in the, East, in the West Coast that we've had. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, very good points. Thank you. Anyone else for the good of the order? All right, with that, we're going to move on to the active transportation plan update, and presenting on that will be CAC. So right. you're I'll up again, up buddy. Here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and um, I have a short presentation on this as well. Uh, the active transportation plan is considered as a sub-element of the transportation plan, and so this does not replace our transportation plan in any ways, but it is just a small um, sub-element that promotes a very specific uh, section of transportation. So um, I have a, a short presentation to capture the effort that was put into uh, creating this plan. Um, in my slides, I have some excerpts from the actual plan. Uh, it's just examples of what's in there, so I won't try and cover everything that's in the plan, but I'll just touch on uh, a, a few things that give um, sort of a summary of what's contained in the plan, and if anybody's interested, the plan is available online, and you can go download it and, and, and read it. Uh, so uh, this process took us about a little over a year. Um, we started in spring. I remember bringing the contract to the city council in the first or second meeting in January of 2023, and from the, then on, we, start, uh, we um, had the consultants working on it, uh, they uh, researched a lot of our existing plans, and then by the summer, we're taking public participation, developing policies, and by fall, we were reviewing those uh, and having it out for SEPA uh, review and comments. The revised draft was posted on online in November, and we've gotten comments from uh, WashDOT and Island County. We incorporated those, and so we now have a revised draft that's coming forward for your, um, uh, for your action. So um, just to summarize again, uh, our consultants uh, looked at all our adopted plans uh, within OCOBOR to gather information that would be related to active transportation and uh, reviewed all the policies within it. They looked at existing conditions. They looked at uh, pedestrian networks, sidewalk gaps. They um, reached out to the public. Uh, the public had many um, uh, venues to provide input. One of them was actually uh, input that you can provide on a map. So if you had some uh, incident or a intersection that uh, you felt uh, needed some attention or you had comments on, you could go geographically locate that and this is just a snapshot of uh, some of the feedback that they got, uh, at least in the areas that they got feedback on. Uh, they looked at almost every intersection uh, in Oak Harbor to determine the level of stress that somebody would have, whether they were biking or walking across. And as you can see, most of the stress levels are along our major arterial streets. 
uh, they looked at uh, the sidewalk coverage. Do we have coverage on both sides, one side, where do we not have coverage? And these are all um, kind of existing uh, information that they built uh, to eventually come up uh, with a, a bike and uh, pedestrian network. Uh, for the entire city. And so you can see um, in this, on this map, there's several of the streets that are uh, uh, recommended to, for bikes and, and networks, but obviously we cannot go and improve all of them, so you start somewhere. So from this network, they uh, distilled it down to a few catalyst projects that the city can start looking at. And um, these are identified on, the, on a map in the plan. Uh, we made sure that uh, this network has east-west connectors and north-south connectors. So if we start looking at these catalyst projects and start to build these projects one by one, hopefully over time you will build a network uh, and make a lot more uh, of the city accessible by this uh, mode of transportation. So um, when you identify these corridors as catalyst projects, you want to kind of what the next step is for the consultants and the staff is to take a look at these corridors and say, what are some of the things that we can accommodate in this corridor? How are the sections? How would, it, how would we you know, start thinking about it? And that's all this initial step does, is to look at these catalyst projects and go, do we have the room? Uh, can, we, can we accommodate this type of uh, traffic movement? Can we accommodate the two-way uh, bike uh, path? And so this is an example of how they, you kind of look at the Bayshore uh, Pioneer Way section, which is one of the corridors, and say, you know, what if we accommodated, what is the approximate section would look like? Um, and so there are some conceptual level sections for these projects, and these are all captured in part of the plan. I have a couple for um, SR20. SR20 is identified as one of the major catalyst projects. Um, and so there was some, just some thought given, you know, uh, SR20 going through Oak Harbor is a complicated section. It is not uniform. It has different right-of-ways. It has different speeds. And so when we get to the actual project, there'll be a lot more detail and a lot more work that needs to be done by both the city and uh, our transportation engineers at the state level. But this is just to capture just an idea. We had, through surveys, uh, people indicate that they felt that this divided um, uh, 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 pathway is what makes people safe. And so we tried to accommodate that configuration uh, wherever we can. So these are just conceptual level um, um, sections on, on what to expect uh, if we were to do all these improvements. And this is captured in uh, one of the chapters uh, as the catalyst projects. So that was just a conceptual level section level in terms of you know, uh, ideas on projects. And then we asked our consultants with the money that was remaining in the grant to make some more detailed conceptual drawings for certain sections. And they started off with three. We had uh, some leftover money and we jumped to six. So of the nine catalyst projects that are suggested, we have conceptual plans for at least six of them, which is one step closer to trying to make this work. Um, as you can see, SR20 is not on this. This is something that we knew that the, it's a state facility. Uh, the state project, uh, some funding for it, they say is available in 27, 28, which means the project will come two to three years after that. And we know that a lot can change uh, with washed-out standards can change, expectations can change, and so we wanted to not spend our effort and time and money trying to design the SR20 corridor, and we just came up with those con conceptual ideas uh, with the idea that when WashDOT does do that project, there'll be a little, mo there'll be a lot more involvement, and time and money is better spent then than to spend it here. So SR20 is not on the list. However, we have other uh, important corridors here: Midway Boulevard, uh, the Pasic O'Leary is, uh, I think, a hidden street in the, uh, that connects north south of Oak Harbor that cyclists or pedestrians can get off the highway right at the north end of the city and walk through some nice neighborhoods, which is usually preferable for that type of transportation. 
The Bayshore Pioneer one is a very popular one. That's uh, uh, our waterfront trail. And to add more to that trail, uh, it doesn't hurt. That's the jewel of Oak Harbor and continuous improvement along there. Uh, Crosby Avenue and Heller, those are major connectors. One of the, uh, uh, when we started off with the active transportation plan, the main intent was to make sure that we have a network for our residents to move around the city and get to employment centers and shopping centers. And so this network is targeted towards serving the residents and connections to the county and the regional networks will then come naturally once we develop this network. So the focus is on trying to get most of our streets connected. And so the Southwest 3rd, 4th, and Jib Street was also chosen as one of those uh, uh, conceptual design uh, candidates. <clears throat> So um, when, um, so these six corridors got a little uh, more attention in terms of analysis and review. And so the consultants go through and identify, um, you know, ch uh, sections for improvement and, and uh, review the, and eventually you get to a, a, a conceptual drawing like this for the entire section that involves an aerial with some conceptual drawings in terms of how to stripe the streets so that you can accommodate the transportation. Now, this is still not final. However, this is really one, cl one step closer. Um, what the intent was to try and create a plan so that when we have funding available through grant resources and we need something that's very project ready and we need to respond very fast, we can take on these type of projects because we have a certain level of design already invested in them. So we did this for uh, about uh, six of the projects, uh, six of the corridors. As you can see, I just pulled uh, some sections out just to show you an example. Again, the appendix has all of them for the six corridors. Uh, there's uh, traffic circles uh, recommended. There are places where we don't have sidewalks, where we may have to accommodate people walking on the streets. How do you do that? How do you mark the barriers? Uh, there, there could be sections where you may not have center lines. You may have a, 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 a kind of a single lane where you yield to the oncoming traffic and it's um, so there's a lot of new ideas and creative ideas in this plan. Um, and uh, they did some cost estimates as well for these conceptual drawings because they had a chance to invest more time in it. And uh, they came up and these estimates are there on in your appendix as well. So for the six projects here, I think the total uh, comes up to about $12 million or so. And of course, we don't have that money in our, in our budget and we don't have that in our CIP. However, this is a start in that direction. So now we have some numbers, planning level estimates. And if we were to apply for a grant, if we were to program a project in the CIP, we know the approximate cost and, and how and where to do that. So this is just to get us started in that direction. So uh, again, the draft ATP was available in November. Uh, we went through a SEPA checklist in, with the state and Island County gave us some comments. We incorporated their comments. We love to work with regional partners. And so if you look at the appendix in the document, we took all of Washed Out's material that they gave us and said, yes, we want to work with you. We will take that. We'll put it in our plan as a way that we meant that we communicated with you and that we can work together uh, when the project comes forward. So we incorporated all those comments into the revised draft and we posted that in March. And so now I'm just having a touch base with you at the workshop so that I can bring it to you at your April meeting for action. So uh, with that, um, I will open it up for questions and comments. Great, thanks, CAC. And I know that Councilmember Hoffmeyer has a question. Thank you. Yeah, CAC, really good work on this. The uh, the six priorities there uh, look pretty solid as well. Uh, the one question I had with with you and uh, Alex both here, um, with with regards to the Bayshore uh, Trail, if you come if you come ashore just a little more those half a dozen or those four blocks of Pioneer or whatever it is between between Highway 20 and where it goes to the one way. That that pavement very clearly is only gonna hang in there, I mean, another year or two at most. And I know most of council has continually said they would love to see those four lanes become two with a road diet. Um, is, is there possibly a way to 
combined projects and, and knowing that none of those six priorities are budgeted, is, is that something to where it almost pays for itself? Absolutely. I mean, we want to overlap this with all our existing projects. So if we have a project that's going in a water line that's going in over a surface, we want to try and incorporate some of this into that. Absolutely. So we don't need to have it separately. We have similarly, we chose the Midway Corridor because there's already a project in the CIP for to improve Midway, I think in 28 or 29. And we wanted to have this in the book so that when they do the Midway project, this will be a guideline to try. When we put it back together, it'll look different. You know. Awesome. Well, again, thank you very much. Good work. And uh, look, look forward to what this looks like in a decade. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say thank you. Uh, looking at this document, it's I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around the amount of work that that went into that. Um, the amount of time that experts think about, you know, every inch of sidewalk and what order to put, which I mean, it's just it's an extraordinary amount of work, and it's really uh, digestible. So thank you. It's a great document, and yeah, like Shane, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do with it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. CAC, thanks so much for your presentations. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to the last item under development services, development services annual report, and that will be Director Dave Cool again. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the delay. Uh, this is the Development Services Annual Report. Uh, first, I'll go through a 2023 recap. And this year, we have a pie chart to show you our activity levels. So if you start at the very bottom, that's the mechanical permits. Uh, we issued 412 of those last year. Uh, mechanical permits are furnaces, uh, air exchangers, fireplaces, that kind of thing. So you can see that we spent a lot of time doing the smaller permits, permits like that. If you go around clockwise around this pie chart, you can see occupancy permits. We had quite a few of those. Uh, those are CFOs for houses and for buildings, uh, commercial buildings. Alterations could be residential or commercial in green. Purple is new buildings, and that could be new houses or sometimes new commercial buildings. Plumbing permits at the very top of the pie chart, 29 of those. Sign permits, those are always for commercial activities. And you can go around the chart uh, on your own and see uh, different levels of things that we touch. Total fees in the last year was 440,233.88. And that fee number includes the building plan check, the building permit, and all the connection charges. So that includes your sewer connection charges, water connection charges, and everything associated with a building permit. This particular chart is your land use applications. And so you can see at the bottom, pre-application meetings, that's where we focus a lot of our time and attention because we feel if we spend a lot of time up front with customers explaining how to get through our process, they'll do better in the long run, and they do. So we have a lot of those, but those don't always turn into permit applications because it's sort of a, uh, a due diligence period for people. Site plan review in the light green, we did seven of those. Examples of those might be something like the Sonic or the Glint Car Wash, an actual site plan. Conditional use permits in purple, we had six of those, and those could be drive-throughs. We had a couple of those uh, specifically. Gary Oak tree trimming permits, we had a number of those. We had three annexation permits. And preliminary plats, we had two. Uh, we had two shoreland exemptions. So we do a lot of different things in the Development Services Department. Total land use applications were 49. So the matrix chart that you get in your report every month is one that uh, we spend a lot of time on. I think that's fairly popular where you see all the various cases we have, who's doing it, what the type is, what the status is. This is a, a broad look at that entire chart. So 15 of those are land use reviews. 
10 are pre-application reviews, nine are building construction, four are engineering, and two are annexation. So that's the broad-based look at that uh, particular report you get. This is the rundown of the Planning Commission work that you just saw earlier today, so there's no need to touch on this. This is the legislative things that we accomplished last year. Site photos, uh, this is a photo of Bayshore. So you can see this is where our property exists uh, downtown with the uh, commercial buildings in the background. This is Serendipity Lane, a uh, good project we've been working on. Uh, Sweet Rice is the building on the right. Uh, if you go on the top left, the building over there is the oldest building in the city of Oak Harbor. And the building in the front left is the uh, South Shore condominium complex. Spent a lot of time working with all those folks there, getting easements created, uh, getting uh, the trash removed, and making sure that people could have, find a place to park. This is a scene that you see every day driving around town, but I thought I'd show it to you anyway. Uh, this is the hillside project that you're quite familiar with and is uh, quite, uh, quite a long range project. This is Marin Woods, which is also a long time project here in town, has been through two different developers. In fact, this project, when it first came in, uh, Ray Lindenberg started work here and that was nine years ago. So we've got a new developer now that's uh, going guns, on, great guns on this one and it's nearing completion. There are 10 lots I think that are reserved in this development for Habitat for Humanity. So I think the developer of this uh, gifted those to Habitat. Same development, uh, Marin Woods. So moving forward, uh, 2024. Serendipity Lane uh, is ongoing in 23 and 24. The central development area will continue on. Multifamily tax exemption, that's a program that the council looked at last year. We'll bring that back. We still have the, uh, the vendor on contract. We're gonna need some incentives to help develop affordable housing in town. And so we'll bring that back to you uh, with a little more information. Dolan Design Group is designing buildings for downtown. And then the one we talked about in the planning commission report that uh, uh, was the uh, market feasibility for the CDA as well as downtown for the Center for Creative Recycling. Those will all be big projects coming up and what we've decided to do is slow down some of these specific projects till we get the comprehensive plan started. We wanted CAC to be able to get started and bring the big umbrella of the comp plan up first and then later this summer or early fall we'll get these other smaller studies started. Code compliance, uh, that's one that uh, you don't see much of, but uh, Ray Helsley's been around a long time. Uh, the chart, the way you understand this is 2023 is in yellow and 2022 is in blue. So you can relatively compare the levels each year. At the very top of the chart, vegetation has been the biggest complaint that we get. And that's always somebody has trees or bushes on their own private property that's growing out over the sidewalk. And so since we regulate private property and code compliance, we, we talk to them uh, to help protect the sidewalk. Second category down is new, that's graffiti. So you can see that was just done in 2023. The place where we found the most graffiti was behind the movie theater. And so we cleaned all that up back there, all those buildings had graffiti on them and Helsley got all that taken care of. Trash and illegal dumping is the third category, and sidewalks, vehicles, uh, signs, all those, as you go down the list, uh, you can see the chart and how it reads. Total open cases, though, if you look over to the right, you can see the total open cases that came into the previous, from the previous year were four, and we took in 92 complaints, and an amazing closure ratio of 98%. And that's really good in terms of code compliance in most cities I've worked in. So to be able to get that kind of closure rate is uh, really nice to see. Economic development. <clears throat> this is our last category. Economic development was transferred to our department in uh, February, uh, late February, early March. And so we've taken that on. Uh, Steve McCaslin has come over to our department, even though he already sits down with us in uh, development services. 
He was established with some goals back in January of 2024. And those goals are business expansion and business retention. So on the retention side, uh, the goal is to meet with five of the 10 largest firms in town, to meet with 105 firms by June 30th of this year, and implement a business climate survey. So what he and I did a couple of times is we went out and we saw some businesses and talked to them downtown and encouraged them to complete the survey. And then he and I went out to Goldie Road, met some really interesting businesses I didn't know existed, uh, met Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Gateway Automotive. Uh, there's a propane business out there. And so we're, we've gotten their email addresses and we're sending uh, more requests out there to fill out uh, surveys. So, so far, uh, effective March 15th uh, in business retention, we've met with four out of the five largest firms. I shouldn't say we, CAC has done, or CAS has done most of this on his own. We've contacted 49 businesses as of March 15th. And as of today, uh, he's contacted 67. So uh, hitting those uh, particular goals well. So we're referring each business to a survey. And as of March 15th, 11 surveys were returned. I don't know exactly how many are effective as of today. So we're doing that follow-up uh, to contact people and make sure they complete the survey and then develop data to help uh, analyze that. Workforce development, that's another uh, challenge we have. Uh, Allen County uh, needs some construction trade development because a lot of contractors here can't uh, find people to do the work. So back when Ginger started three years ago, uh, she reached out to the high school shop class instructor and got him excited about um, helping create a program for building inspection. But like things are, we get busy and we kind of did other things and didn't get around to it. So we've encouraged Kaz to reach out to uh, Roy Cohn's his name, and he has done that. And so we'll get that started again to talk about a career path for people in construction and in inspection. Uh, CAS has also met with the Skagit College and Grand Canyon University. They have some uh, job training programs. And the Snow Wild Vocation Technical Program is also available as a resource to us. Business creation. Uh, researching various incentives. So CAS has spent some time researching incentives for commercial and industrial areas. Business incubators is something we've seen recently. A couple of small business incubators uh, have been established, one of them downtown, and then also Main Street's going to do their own incubator, uh, create an office space for somebody to get their business started. Uh, CAS is also working with the EDC on uh, business creation programs. And as I mentioned earlier, we're researching food truck options uh, as a way to help uh, develop business opportunities for people in town. Networking is something also the council expressed, I think it was earlier in January or late last year, of some goals you'd like to see economic development achieve. Uh, networking with area economic development professionals. So that means people like the Snohomish County Economic Alliance. Uh, that's a big group in Snohomish County. Uh, try and learn some of the best practices that some of these other people are doing in economic development and bring some of that activity back here. So we want to utilize that and try and develop our programs for business development. So last but not least, this is the team that gets it all done. This is the development services staff, a great team. I want to thank you for your earlier comments, uh, Councilman Wiesner. Um, appreciate uh, and I'll make sure the team knows uh, that we got good positive feedback. Um, on the left is Brian uh, Colbert. He's our building inspector plans examiner. Next to him is Ray Lindenberg. Uh, he's our uh, senior planner. Of course, you all know Ginger Pennington. She's right there. Back behind them is yours truly. In front of me is Sarah Heller. To the right of her is Patty O'Mahoney. Uh, to the right of her is Nolan Grunska. He's our newest planner. Uh, Ray Helsley is right next to him. And Kat Kamak is next to him. This is uh, the beauty of Photoshop, uh, has a tendency to be able to get everybody at the same time. So, uh, but thank you again for the compliments and, uh, 
and I'm certainly had my ears open for the, the participant of the two and a half hour conversation you had. Uh, do you want to give us any hints as to who you were talking to? <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time and attention. Available for any questions you might have. Thanks so much, David. Cool. Uh, any questions or comments from council? Yes, Councilmember Wiesner. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's a lot of good information, especially you know, in the in, in the graphs and looking at things on an annualized basis. And I just have one comment and and one and a couple of suggestions. First off, you know, when we were looking at the ADU regulation, right, there was a huge fear that there would be this landslide in every uh, neighborhood in our entire community would turn into duplexes with a bunch of cars parking on the roads and and all of that right and so we actually held back on that ordinance um, and held back some things we could do to help promote that ordinance out of that fear right but you you get it statewide ADUs is a, is a huge conversation so so huge that the state has passed um, laws requiring cities such as us um, to to look at our ADU ordinances and allow them I mean that's that's how adamantly um, uh, other areas are seeing this as a step towards that housing affordability because it not only makes housing affordable for people to you know build a second residence on a property but it also makes it affordable for the person living in the main home right because uh, some of those costs get uh, shared out and or if you're taking a larger house and making it into an accessory to uh, attached accessory dwelling unit it makes both sides of that house more affordable. So the fact that I see one application tells me one, one of a few things. Either A, we haven't done a good enough job of getting out to the public and letting them know that that, that ordinance has changed and, and uh, you know, the, the things that we've done have made that easier. Uh, two, it, it tells me that the ordinance is too restrictive and, and it's being done and people are just doing it without a a permit, which is again something that we over-regulate ourselves into. We put so regulations on so thick that it's still being done, but people just circ circumnavigate the rules, which isn't good for anybody. You know, contractors in there working and and and, and you know doing non-conforming electrical and all sorts of possibilities, right? Um, or three, it's, it's it's just not needed. Um, and, and the reality is, I think it's really that that fourth one, right? That 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 we put a couple of caveats in there which has made it hard to meet all the criteria and one of them was that parking right I, I think we required still to keep additional parking spaces even if there was on street parking available um, you know so I'd like some feedback it, it, you know if we are getting requests for ADU permits and, and we're just not able to meet that criteria um, so I, I'd like you know follow up on that and more importantly the pre-application meeting 17 of them I think it would be great to have a follow-up system in place for those 17 pre-application meetings for any of those pre-applications that, that don't continue on to actually submitting an application to understand why. Um, you know, there's only 17 of them. Let's face it, one, one, one and a half a year, right? Now, out of the 17, it looks like we got seven that went on to site plan review. You know, we may have some others that were less complicated permits that were not land use. But I'd sh it'd sure be nice to hear from the ones who didn't move forward with the project why they didn't move forward with the project. Is there something within our code or ordinance that didn't allow them to? I think that'd be a valuable piece of information to have. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Wiesner. Councilmember Hoffmeyer. Yeah, with, with regards to the legislative adjustments that were in there, and I guess uh, adjustments that might be coming over the next year, and with regards to the affordability, like, like Councilmember Wiesner was just discussing, is the, uh, is the state's desire for some of that uh, affordable housing to not have a parking requirement at all? Is there some adjustment along those lines? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mayor Wright, if I may answer. Um, the state has three different pieces of legislation we're following. Uh, it's requiring things like we're required to allow two accessory dwelling units on one property. So you have a primary dwelling plus two accessory dwelling units are required. I mean, that doesn't mean you have to build them, but we have to allow them if they can fit. Second thing is more density. Uh, they're encouraging a whole lot more density in all single family zones. Uh, they haven't talked about reducing parking standards for accessory dwelling units, 
but we're talking about it internally. And so as we move forward with the comprehensive plan and all the different goals we have with housing, uh, we'll start uh, bringing some of those uh, concepts forward uh, to talk about reducing parking. Uh, my good friend, Steve Schuler, uh, if it were up to him, he would uh, get rid of all the parking requirements in most of the town. And uh, we laugh about that, but uh, he's, he's mostly right. I mean, there's a lot of places we don't need as much parking. And with his, he's advocating for all the uh, uh, automated cars that can go everywhere and pick people up and, and all the Uber rides and, and less demand for parking. So certainly we get that and uh, that would be worth pursuing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for all that. And yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's probably where we're going to end up in the future. And I think, gosh, it was probably a Skagit County bumper sticker that alluded to, to pavement being forever. And it, in a way, I guess that is true. I mean, it's unfortunate to be building uh, exorbitant amounts of parking that, that we may not need in 10, 15 years. So thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or questions for the good of the order? Yes, Council Member um, Marshall. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I think I'm going to just piggyback on Councilmember Wiesner's point there. Um, you know, with uh, economic development being part of your department now, um, Kaz had mentioned before being an ombudsman for um, those development people. And, and if, and I don't see that in the current presentation, I think that would be a perfect task for him as that as part of that ombudsman role is to find out how from those pre apps that don't move forward. You know touching base with them again and finding out what it is that that was prohibitive from them from moving forward, I think would be um, extremely helpful to, to the department. So, and then I uh, also wanted to piggyback on something he had said previously, and that was, you know, just the whole atmosphere down in development services now is, is completely different than it used to be years ago. Anytime I'd have to go down there, I felt like I was getting ready for combat and, and uh, <laughs> it is, the staff is amazing and, and, and uh, it's absolute pre pleasure to work with and, and, and appreciate the mentality of finding a way to yes uh, that they seem to have these days. And so um, kudos to you and to the staff and, and thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, we'll make sure we follow up with CAS and uh, follow up on those pre-application meetings. Good suggestions. And like I say, we'll come back with more housing uh, analysis in the future. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you have a second, we have uh, one more thing to do. Sure. Um, and we've been working on our permitting system for probably two or three years, trying to get ready so we could <clears throat> actually centralize everything we do. So we wanted to centralize our land use permits, our building permits, and make it easy for the public to use. So I think Commissioner, or not Commissioner, uh, Councilman Wiesner at one time said he wanted to be able to go out in the, in the field and click on his phone and see what development this is and see who's doing it. So for today, uh, we'll show you how to get to the information. So this is your city website. Uh, you all know how to get there. Go to the website and then click on how do I. And then after you go how do I, what do you want to do? We well, want to find permits. So that's all you need to know. And that'll get you to this screen. So congratulations, you are now in our permitting system. So we're not actually going to have you uh, process a permit today, but um, if you go into the open permit section at the top right check mark, uh, there's, this is a scroll down of everything we've done the last three years in our new permitting system. So you can see all the various details of, of information we track. Uh, you can find this stuff um, right there in our permit system. So I've asked Tim to pick on one of these numbers and uh, just we can click on it and go through it and show you some of the information that's available. Whatever the number is. Actually, you can just click on the highlighted link if you want, and you can get that permit open. Just go to the left. It's easy to get there. Just click on one of those. Which one? Uh, there's a number on that sheet. Yeah, 
So talking to Sabrina, uh, we thought going to the how do I and then going to permits was really easy. But she was so enthused by it, she wants to get this on our front page of our web page. So you can just click one time and find it. So. So this is an overview. It tells you uh, broadly exactly what it's about. If you scroll down, these are various information that tells you how big the house is, uh, what kind of permits it has, if it's electric, uh, different details on garages. And if you keep scrolling down, uh, you'll find these are the permit fees that were paid, uh, building, uh, sewer and water, all those kinds of fees will give you that information. If you keep scrolling a little further down, you see the staff that touched the project, uh, whether it's been approved, and so on and so forth. So uh, each, each one will have a little bit of different detail in it because uh, some of them are caught up, some are not. Uh, but that's the general permitting side. So if you'd like to go back to the land use side. Thank you. Uh, open projects down in the lower right-hand corner. So projects versus permits. Projects are land use cases. So these are your subdivisions, your condition use permits, uh, site plans, uh, various other uh, details of projects we have. Will this be archived? Uh, yes, it'll, it'll always stay live. So this is saved in the cloud, and so you'll always be able to get to this. So Tim is clicking on one of these. This is uh, on Crosby. Can't read it from here, but that could be the Crosby, Crosby Heller project, I think, is an apartment complex. So you can see the time that it came in uh, when it was considered complete on May 12th. If you keep going down the screen, when it was technically complete, uh, when it was got, got through the various processes we have. Uh, and then you can see the various fees that were paid. And then the reviewers. So you can see each reviewer, uh, Ray Lindenberg, John Pollock, uh, Ray touched it again, then Patty, and then John again, then Gideon, our archaeologist, then Patty, then John, then Patty. So a number of people have touched this, uh, but you can see where it's approved and where it's complete. And so you can find out information about our, our process. So we've been waiting for three years to show you this, and uh, so thank you for your patience. Uh, but it took us a little longer to get there than we thought. Uh, the company that helped build this, Davenport, was here last week. And so we went through uh, lots of programming uh, to figure out some problems we were having and permitting. And I think we're getting closer all the time. <clears throat> Obviously, someday we'll have all this information tied to GIS, uh, which is uh, a future-oriented goal. Uh, but so somebody will be able to click on a map and find all this information, too. So uh, any questions or things you want to talk about? Great job. That's great. Nope. Mayor Pro Tem, yeah. Um, Sabrina, I'm wondering if you can use your skills to do a quick little like two or three minute tutorial to put on our YouTube channel if you're not already working on it. You are reading my mind. <laughs> We've already had this conversation. Um, we also, um, like he was talking about, we're changing one of the buttons specifically to this because this is one of those topics that the community is continually asking for. Yeah. So we're going to do a tutorial. We're also going to have step-by-step -step information as well. So just make it easier for the community, also the paper, to access this information as they need. Yeah, this is great because when people say, hey, what's going on with X, Y, and Z? Instead of me digging through my email for the last like leadership meeting to see well the permits that are in the works now we can just direct them right here and they can find out anything they want to know it's thank you it's everything i hoped it would be thank you mayor uh one other point uh, for the records people uh, this will become our portal for public records in the future so people will be able to go here and find information uh, probably not every single detail that that you need but it'll certainly help stem some of that 
Yeah, we appreciate this because when people are asking about a specific project and then our records officers having to go look for that information and pull it back and go through it, this will be available where people can just access that information, information as they need it. So we're very excited. I will admit, Mayor Pro Tem, I cheered at my desk when David showed me. And he was like, oh, you're very excited. I'm like, yes, yes. That's big news. Great job. Yes, thank you very much. Cool. Anything else for the good of the order on this? All right, David, thank you thank so you. much and your whole team. Thank you. All right, it is 429. We still have four departments that have to report out. So would someone, would you guys like a five minute recess or you want to power through? Okay, five minute recess.
All right, we're moving on to the next section, which is finance. Permanent available recurring funding options presented by Deputy City Administrator David Goldman. Good afternoon, everybody. David Goldman, Deputy City Administrator. So this is an overview of some permanent available revenue options. Um, so at the last workshop in February, um, Chief Slowick um, presented some uh, police department's um, recommended staffing needs. And as you can see on the bottom, those needs were four uh, patrol officers, one drug detective, and about a half-time uh, receptionist. Um, I did some calculations based on the recently approved bargaining agreement with police. And um, a starting police officer at the first step with salary and benefits is about $113,000. So I'll go over a couple of temporary funding options first that can help fill the gap. And then we'll go over the permanent funding options. Um, this first slide talks about the uh, Department of Justice COPS grant. That grant will fund a total of $125,000 per position, and that's spread out over three years. So you'd have to take that amount and divide by three to get the yearly amount. So I put this chart together showing um, the salary and the benefit percentage estimate with the total payroll for, um, you know, for the first three years of uh, starting police officer's uh, salary. And um, I, I put the COPS grant on the COPS grant line, which is that 125,000 divided by three. And you can see that in the first year, it covers 37% of the payroll. The city would have to pick up about $71,000. And as the pay increases, as the officer would go through steps and you know, just assume COLA increases, that percentage of uh, payroll keeps going down that's covered by the COPS grant. And the city would have to pick up a larger and larger share. And of course, after the third year, the grant program expires and um, the city would have to pick up the um, complete costs of the uh, officers. Um, the next slide is the uh, Johnson & Johnson opioid settlement. Um, we've received some other opioid settlements that um, Chief Slowick has talked to the council about last year. This most recent one um, will provide about $1.2 million, and that won't be paid out slowly over time. Um, our understanding is that would be paid out in a lump sum. Um, that amount of money, just based on that same salary schedule, um, just the person going up through the STEP program, that's in the bargaining agreement and also just standard, you know, uh, long-term average COLAs, um, that amount of money would cover about eight years um, of an officer or, a, or an entry-level drug detective's uh, salary. So there's a couple of permanent funding solutions that um, I was able to find um, that are available to, um, to the city to implement. Um, first one here is a public safety sales tax that would fund for police officers, um, the voters would have to approve it. Um, you'd need a majority, 50% plus one approval. Um, the filing deadline for the August primary is in May, and the filing deadline to get on the November general election would be in August. And there's two options right now. There's a county-led one and a city-led one. Um, the city-led one would, would have been a maximum, um, is, well, is a maximum of 0.1%, and that would raise approximately half a million dollars per year um, the county-led one, um, that could go up to a maximum of 0.3% sales tax, and that would raise for the city of Oak Harbor about $540,000 per year um, if for each 0.1%. So if the county went all the way up to 0.3, that would be 543,000 times three. And those formulas, um, the formulas between the city and the county-led one vary based on the formulas that are in the RCW, which are explained in more detail in the uh, MRSC Revenue Guide for Cities um, that's available online. So here's what that looks like in more detail. A 0.1 cent um, sales tax that's led by the city. Oak Harbor would get about 84%. Island County would get about 15%, and the state would, state would take their 1% cut. And Oak Harbor would see about half a million dollars a year. Um, it was led by the county. I mean, the total is much larger because the county would be, everybody in the county would, would be taxed on this, not just within the city limits. 
And um, the total is 1.5 million, but the city's share based on the formula that's in the state law would be about 540,000. And you could see the share that would go to Island County and then Langley and Coopville and all that. Um, another um, funding solution that we found was uh, the business and occupation tax. So according to the MRSC, there are four major general revenue sources available for cities. You have the property tax, which is limited to that 1% um, plus new construction, or of course we can do a levied lid lift to bring that lid up, which we had just recently done for the uh, fire, fire station and the staffing of the fire station. Um, sales tax, which, which was growing two years ago, was growing pretty quickly, but based on what I, see, I saw for the year end 2023, it's pretty much leveled off. It's not really growing. Um, the utility tax actually decreased slightly because we did lower the utility rates by about 3%. Um, and then we have the business and occupation tax. And about 50 cities in Washington use this tax. So here's some details of it. Um, this tax requires council approval. Um, the maximum tax rate is 0 0.002 times the business's gross annual receipts which equates to about one-fifth to one percent. Um, there's a handful of cities that have higher rates than that, but they're grandfathered in. They would have had those rates at least for 40 years, because I think it was 1982 or something when the grandfather, you know, when the law changed or something. Um, the minimum tax threshold is $20,000, which means that the first $20,000 that a business earns is exempt from the tax. But when we went ahead and looked at um, what the city, what the 50 cities actually have as thresholds, it varies from as low as that 20,000 all the way up to $1 million. Um, and of course, you can take a look at that MRC revenue guide for more details, or the agenda packet I put together too has some more details. Um, this is in your backup. I just did screenshots of those 50 cities so you can see what the rates are, um, the name of the city, you have the rates for the different types of businesses. Um, it, it seems that, that um, you know, the ones that are grandfathered in might have more variable rates than others, but the ones that have passed um, a, a business and occupation tax in the last 20 or 30 years, they tend to have the same rate across all types of businesses. Um, there's tax thresholds. Um, the threshold I was talking about earlier was an annual tax threshold, but some cities do decide to collect quarterly, so they just take that threshold, divide by four. Um, so you can see uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of 20, there's some at a million, and there's a bunch in between. So I ran some scenarios about what that might look like for the city of Oak Harbor. Um, I picked three different thresholds. Um, the first one was five million, which is higher than any of the other cities, but I figured we don't have to follow what the other cities do. We can do a higher threshold. And that would mean the first $5 million of a business's gross annual receipts would be shielded from this tax. Um, with that option, 27 businesses would, would pay the tax, which is only about 1% of all businesses in Oak Harbor. Um, so based on the gross annual receipts and the tax rate, we'd be looking at raising about $800,000 a year. The maximum amount paid by, I guess, the largest business that's in there would be $132,000. Um, and the minimum would be about $163. But a better reading would be the, um, the median number on the bottom. Uh, that's the number that's in the middle. So out of the, if you take the 27 um, businesses, the number that's right in the middle, or I guess the average of the two numbers in the middle, since that's an odd number, is um, about $11,000 a year. And I also have um, a couple other options up there too. Like if, if the threshold was at a million dollars, about 178 businesses would be affected. And if the threshold was as low as $100,000, you'd have 555 businesses affected or about a quarter of all the businesses in town. And you could see the dollar amounts um, raised by those other options. Uh, option two is about 1.3 million and option three is about 1.9 million. So, um, you know, I guess where the next steps are, um, just compared to the attainment of one-time revenues for grants or for settlements or donations, permanent 
recurring revenue sources that can be used to fund ongoing personnel, operations, and maintenance, and debt payments are, are rarer. It's a lot easier to get money to build something than to get money to actually operate it and staff it after the thing is built. Um, and, our, and our financial policies do say that if we are going to create a new um, cost center, you know, new staff or, or new program that's going to cost um, money that's going to be recurring um, year after year after year, um, we're required to find a recurring revenue source to cover those expenses that will be recurring year after year. Um, so, you know, that, that last option I showed, it does raise more funds than it will cost for the uh, four officers and, and, the, other off and the, the drug enforcement officer that um, Chief Slowick had talked about. So the thought was, you know, if it's going to raise an excess of that, what can that excess money be used for? One of them, you know, it could be used for debt service and borrowed funds. For example, you know, if we're going to go down the road of constructing parks or, or, you know, dredging the marina or doing other stuff at the marina or other capital facility projects, that ongoing revenue source can help pay for that debt service. Um, if there's capital projects that we anticipate completing that don't have a revenue source attached to the operations and maintenance of it, this possibly can be used for that if it's implemented. And then there might be costs of contracted services that will go up. I think we'll, we might go over some a little bit later in the meeting um, that came up. And, um, you know, there's no ongoing revenue source tied to some of these contracts. So that might be something to think about, too. Um, if the council was to go down that road for that last option of the business and occupation tax. So, um, you know, there's other sources, too, that we can explore. I mean, there's always the levy lid lift option, but though we just did one, not sure how palatable that will be. And, of course, you know, the utility taxes are at six and a quarter. There's no uh, ceiling on some of those utility taxes. Those could be looked at, but as you know, right now, people's, you know, tax, uh, utility bills are are elevated, you know, based on our debt service we're paying on that clean water facility. And, you know, I'm not sure if that's the best option the council would want to approach right now um, to raise revenues to cover the cost of these, um, you know, of the proposal that, uh, that we have for the police officers. So, um, so anyway, with that, um, we're open to questions. Okay, uh, before we take questions, can you put the options back up on the screen, please, and leave those up there so we can use those as discussion? Thank you. And with that, Council Member Wiesner. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, we could talk for this on hours, and I'm not going to. Um, you know, let, let, let's face it, uh, both B&O and sales taxes are both regressive. Uh, sales taxes have uh, the largest impact often on the people who can afford it the least. Um, you know, I've never been a huge fan of that model, and I've never been a huge fan of the B&O tax. You know, it's a... Uh, it's regressive to business because, of course, you know, we could have a local manufacturer here selling product to a local retailer who, you know, sells product to their, their wholesaler. Every step of the way, it gets, it gets taxed, right? Each business gets taxed every step of the way. Those uh, increased costs get passed on to the consumer. With all that said, um, if we were to do something, I, I would certainly sit down and consider uh, option one and option two of the B&O tax. Um, uh, option three, I, I'd have a huge problem with it. It affects too many startup businesses. It's a, it's an amount of. I mean, you, you know, for a startup, cash flow is is, is huge, and, and taxes, of course, take a huge part out of cash flow, which allow the businesses to grow um, in our community. And and you know, I, I feel if we're going to discuss this, we discuss it with the the businesses who are off the ground and and you know aren't the, aren't aren't the startups. And so, so you know, I. I, quite frankly, don't even necessarily have a problem with the, the $5 million threshold because obviously we know those are going to affect uh, probably more of the out-of-area businesses, the, 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 the national corporations, the chain stores, and, and, you know, they're paying that tax. In other communities that they're paying uh, that tax in, and they don't necessarily come in and raise the prices on the shelf to, to cover that, right? They look at that as a cost of, of doing business nationally, and, and quite frankly, us not having that tax here is just kind of a a bonus that goes into to their pocket. So, you know, the, the, the $5 million threshold, I, I, I'd probably jump on in a, in a minute. The, the million dollar threshold would be something I'd certainly uh, can you discuss. I think option three should, you know, totally come off the table. I think it's just too regressive uh, for, for our, our local businesses. Uh, one question for you, David. I assume this would be bondable. Um, 
income yeah, to yeah, there's, there's no restrictions on B and O tax revenue. It's one of the four major revenues to the general funds that the state of Washington allows uh, municipalities to raise. That's um, not not really restricted, like you know, like the other smaller revenues. And and, and that's what makes me lean even more maybe to, towards option two, right? Because you know, excess funds there, you know, we could be looking at you know a half million dollars or more, which could be bondable, which you know could be the the, the money to build our community center with, right? You know, I mean, because. Because let's face it, we're not going to build that community center on, you know, one year's income, right? We're going to have to have some sort of a, a long-term source, right, and that, that we can borrow against and, and make sure we'll be able to, 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 to pay that debt down. Obviously not the greatest time to be taking on bond debt, right? But, you know, hopefully, you know, with the, the Fed's, you know, next three rate reductions and, and things lightening up on that end, you know, we could get back to a point where, you know, uh, yeah. Taking that half million dollars, bonding it out, and using it for a large project could be beneficial. Yeah, to like us. like if it was done today, the rates are elevated. But or, you know, the word in the street is they should start to be lowering those rates, hopefully by June. But that's what they said a few months ago about March. But we'll see how it goes. Okay. Well, like I say we go on for hours. Those are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So just for just for a little bit of perspective too, just to make sure I'm understanding this right. The hundred thousand dollars at point zero 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 two, or that at that rate, that's twenty dollars a year, right? Not sure what you're saying there. The rate of point zero zero two at a hundred thousand dollars of annual gross receipts would that be twenty dollars a year of tax? Is that what that is? Well, that's the amount that's shielded from the tax. So the first hundred thousand gotcha. dollars would be okay. shielded from the tax. Gotcha. Okay. So those numbers that you see there for the maximum, minimum, median, and all that—that's based on the gross receipts for the business above $100,000. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Councilmember Member Hoffmeyer. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, first of all, David, uh, really good work on the ideals and the, the numbers there, like always. You know, for, for me, uh, I mean, our most, our most basic responsibility up here is to ensure public safety. Um, it has been, it's been clear for some time that the PD is understaffed. Um, <laughs> I, I was quite frustrated that we didn't have this conversation a couple years ago when, when we were talking about expanding uh, one of our city departments and the impact that would have on the general fund. You know, that, that's when I had brought it up at the time. Uh, we, we have to pay for it and we have to have proper staffing at the PD. Um, you know, before I would consider, uh, you know, supporting a B&O tax, for instance, myself, um, I, I would need to see an, an additional fund and that would be, uh, you know, an additional option, I guess, and that would be paying for it out of the general fund and what would we have to cut back on? And if at the end of the day it's not doable, then, then we at least have a justification why a tax would be needed. So. Um, I, I guess that's where I'm at on it. Is I, I would like to see why we why we can't afford it out of the general fund and go from there. But thank you. Yes, Councilmember Stuckey. Um, I'm going to step in it here. So, just in transparency, I don't know if I'm still sold on the fact of the need for those officers. That's maybe a me thing. Um, I prefer objective data. Other besides over subjective data whenever I can. I mean, subjective data says crime's very rampant because there's things like Alert Wibby 2.0, which people have access to, which makes it look like, oh my gosh, this crime is happening when it's, it's always been there, all right? You know, I, I took a look at crime data and online, and I'm trying to find any place that does not list Oak Harbor in the 10 safest cities. Um, you know, I just pulled it up the other day, you know, there's websites. Some are a little more obscure. Some are run by alarm companies. There was one that came out four days ago that put us at number two. Came out four days ago. But, you know, maybe that's a little too more obscure. If I look at the Seattle Times, we're number two. I, I look at, uh, there's an NBC affiliate of Yakima that did a report. We're number seven. Y you know, it's not popular to say no when it comes to, to police. It makes it look like maybe we don't care about public safety or, or maybe that's not a priority for us when it certainly is. And we've approved an awful lot of stuff. I don't think there's anything, at least in my short time here, that we have not approved police coming to us. But I got to ask myself, at what point is there diminishing returns on any more officers? Um, I mean, if we don't do this, is the fear that all of a sudden that number two spot or number seven spot or whatever metric you're using, are we going to jump way down? Or is the, uh, is the idea to try to get us from number two to number one? 
I, I'm just, with how safe our city is, and how much of our city is military, which is pre-screened to be good citizens, I don't know if I'm fully sold on the need for this amount of officers yet. I mean, this is going to be a 14% increase in the department staffing. So is this something that we're looking 10 years down the line with hopefully we get this 5,500 housing units? I guess I'm still struggling with the need for this level of officers. Maybe there's some other way it could be articulated. Uh, if, if we were, you know, number 30 or 40 or 50, I'd be like, oh my gosh, maybe you're right. But, I mean, eventually there's a diminishing return. I mean, we could add 100 officers and probably move up to number one. And so, if you could just help me out a little bit, and it's probably just a me thing. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, so Chief Slowick. Uh, I will say that right now the uh, level of officers we have at 29 commissioned, uh, we are able to do... Um, less services to our community. Um, we're able to do emergency response to the, the 911 calls that we get that are priority, but we are delaying response uh, longer in non-priority calls because we don't have the available officers. We're also unable to do some of the community policing efforts that we um, all love to see, riding bicycles, um, the amount of uh, you know, we have a, a shelter now that's downtown that we, uh, that, that was gone for a while and, and we're having more businesses that are uh, having frustrations and community complaints that we're trying to engage with. We're currently filling some of that with overtime. So it's going to cost us more money to do that. However, that also is burnout on, on staff. So by not increasing um, staffing, what we'll see is... Uh, fewer services provided because a lot of our calls that we're responding to are multiple officer calls where they weren't that a few years ago. Um, and now with um, mandatory overtime, things like that, we'll then have an issue with recruitment and retention of staff that we currently have. And they'll go to locations like Burlington that has 30 officers for a population of 9,000 people. You know, they, they have a lot um, a better work-life balance. And, and today's staff when, that we're hiring, they're looking for a work-life balance. They're not, they're not hungry for that overtime and, and the drive for that where 20 years ago, that's how you paid for vacations. You know, they're, they're looking for those balanced things. So for us, it's, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the need now, but also in the future. And I'm saying, when I'm saying in the future, I'm saying for the next five years, you know, maybe seven years, this is, this is what I believe is sustainable to keep us at the service level that we're, our communities expected from us. And then also to make sure that we have that capacity in the event of a um, active uh, threat incident, something at our schools, we have the staffing available to respond. We're on an island, our, our regional response is is an hour away if we're talking about from Skagit County our county is is currently understaffed with with you know they're having their own staffing needs that we can talk about offline I mean they're doing the best that they can but we're talking about we have a community in Oak Harbor that um, deserves to have proper response from first responders and and a lot of times it's not just the law enforcement side I mean we we respond to as I've offered uh, many presentations, you know, CPRs in progress, children choking, those type of things where we're saving lives because we're out on the streets. So not having those officers will, will delay a lot of that or eliminate us from being able to respond. What if, I understand having four officers, I'm not looking at the drug detective or the receptionist. Mm -hmm. I understand the mentality, at least I think I do, of having four additional officers because essentially adding one more per shift. Yeah. Is that correct? Let's say it was only two additional officers instead of four. Does that then at least help a little bit with the work-life balance while not necessarily providing one more? I mean, it doesn't look as pretty on a graph. Yeah. So, so, what, so the shifts that we work 12-hour shifts, in order for us, because we were 24-7 operations, 365 days a year, in order for us to put one extra body on the street, that requires us to put a person on each shift. I mean, that's, it, 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 that's just the way that works. Um, any bodies will help. You know, we will, if you approve, you know, two bodies in, in 2024 and two more bodies in 2025 or whatever that ends up being as we phase it in, or if it's a lump sum, we'll work with what the council approves and, and the direction the council 
um, goes with. You know, we'll work with that staffing. I am just giving you the best information that I can. I'm not, I'm not being greedy and saying, hey, this is the moon, and I'm trying to compromise. This isn't a sales pitch or anything like that. I'm being honest with you and not even saying that, hey, we're, we're trying to meet national averages or state averages. I, I, we're, we're assessing the work performance that our officers are doing and the availability they have to be doing proactive work. And what we're finding is they are tied up more on current caseloads and are unable to do proactive work. And we are getting inundated with calls requesting that that we can't provide. So do you think that, you know, and it's, I guess it's not fair to just compare us to other cities on a list, but do you think we would slip a little bit in the future if we did not add those officers? I'll just say this, sir, is the, the statistical information or the, what I, I'm unsure where a lot of these places pulled sure, data from. Sure, FBI, but. And I will yeah. say NIBRS reporting there are multiple jurisdictions in this state that don't report to NIBRS. So if we were trying to compare ourselves, and that's when we're talking about NIBRS, that's the federal FBI reporting that we do, and, and, um, uh, and we're very good at reporting that information. Um, other places, if they choose not to report that, they then are just ineligible, ineligible to be on a list. You know, So it's really hard to say where people are pulling data from. I do know that uh, traffic data, and I've been uh, contacted by um, insurance companies that say, hey, well, you guys are number two or number three in safest cities. But when I ask them how they pull the data, they, mm. they're unsure on how they, they can even come up with those numbers. So. Fair I just, I guess maybe I, I was assuming everyone had a report, but that's... I, I, the, will, I will say, I hope we're the second safest community. I really do, because that means that we're doing our job and we're out there engaging with the community and that we have a good relationship, and, and that's what I hope. Um, that's what our officers strive to do. That's what our mission statement's about, is, is having a safe community and, and having dedication to do that. So, Well, it's certainly a testament to your department and the, the citizens here. Going back to this, if we were saying, yeah, we're going to do it, I, I too would be more, I don't like the idea of a sales tax. I, I would be more the option one, the option two. You, you know, I kind of look at myself, you know, I'd be four to six hundred dollars you know a, a year I, from a business perspective not something I couldn't stomach you know you get enough of these certainly it adds up we just did the well not just did but we did the five hundred dollar increase on some of the business licensing to five hundred dollars so um, can any of that money be used um, the council um, earmarked that for economic development so I'll be it putting it I'll be committing it to that fair yeah. fair enough okay so yeah I, assuming they were good with the level of staffing suggested, I too would be more on the option one or option two. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stuckey. Anyone else? Yes, Council Member Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Um, is, is it, has there been any discussion of the county-led um, public safety <laughs> sales tax? Uh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I haven't heard about that in a while. It's been, I, I think I heard a little, some rumblings about that a couple of years ago, but I haven't heard anything recently, maybe. Two years. I have brought it up to um, Council, or, uh, Commissioner Johnson and also the Sheriff and talked with them, asking where they're, are they, do they have any movement on it? It doesn't sound like they do. Maybe that's something that when you guys have a group conversation, you guys can talk about. So I, I'm not a fan of, of sales tax either, nor am I a fan of a B&O tax particularly. Um, it, you know, we're putting this burden potentially on the backs of, you know, 1.2% of the, the business population. Um, is there any concern, I suppose, that these businesses, you know, some of them you know, wouldn't move, but, you know, I can think of one business that's probably in that category that's, that's looking at building, and, and is there a concern that they would then move to, like, a Mount Vernon or someplace that doesn't have this, so, um, you know, it p potentially then we're losing that, those businesses and, and uh, the employees and, and such, and so um, is there any concern or, or thought to that? Um, what? Well, the reason why we provided those three options is, uh -huh. you know, there, there was more concern about perhaps if the threshold was too low that that might occur and it might impact, um, you know, the smaller to mid-sized businesses. But, you know, with option one 
and for option two even, um, those, the impact would be a lot less. It would, it would impact um, just the largest of the largest businesses in the city. And if, um, you know, I can't really say what the names of the businesses are, sure. but, you know, it's probably some of the biggest name, you know, biggest retailers and wholesalers that everybody's familiar with in the city. And if you looked at the list of the 50 cities that uh, currently have a local B&O tax, um, it, it can pretty much be, be assured that some of these places also have um, locations in those cities as well. And they're still thriving and, and operating as businesses in those locations as well. So I, I guess if we were if we were to have to look at one of these, you know, if we were going to go for B and O, I, I would support option one or option two, um, and and I think I, I've made kind of my my stance clear on on the public voting for certain items as well, and and so I, I actually wouldn't be opposed to the idea of a of going to the public for a sales tax to see what level of service that they want to support. So. Thank you, Councilmember Marshall. Anyone else for the good of the order? Yes, Councilmember Wiesner. Just one quick comment. Uh, you know, obviously, no matter what we do, that does not affect us from using DOJ money, right, for bringing on the, the, that for those first three years, right? So we can we can double dip this, right? We can decide a permanent funding source, but we can dip into that DOJ money for for yeah. This for this those doesn't prevent years. that. This is um this is not restricted for any particular thing. So this is yeah, it does not prevent that. There is, I'll just also add that there is discussion at the state level that there might be funding sources available in the future for future, uh, for police officers, and that wouldn't limit us either, um, so. Council Member Stuckey. Well, I thought, I, I would imagine, obviously without naming them, that the locations that are the higher retail are probably also the places you tend to visit the most often. Is that fair? So, so yeah. the, the, the major retailers that would be in that option one, I imagine, would take up a fair amount of your time. I will say a businesses. majority of our retail theft is at big box stores or larger businesses sure. where people are familiar with the uh, techniques to, um, to uh, bypass security features and those type of things because it's common throughout their whole franchise. Or so if you're looking at equitable, you know, the ones that you use you the most. So... Fair enough. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Councilmember Arms. Well, I I think probably the B and O tax. I mean, I hate to come after businesses, but if it's going to be the ones that are probably the most profitable, uh, I don't think it would be good to raise sales tax again. The uh, locals went crazy last time we raised the sales tax, and they weren't really happy. And maybe it's not fair, but probably these businesses do have more contact with you than others. And um, I'd be more inclined to either option one or two. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Our, oh, yes, Council Member Marshall. So just a point of clarification, this is not actually profit, right? This is gross annual receipt. So this is sales, not necessarily profit. So just because you're earning that much doesn't mean you're not spending close to that much in, in product and and in, in employee costs and stuff so uh i i cautioned that it's we're not talking profits here we're talking gross receipts and so and that, that's a big distinction i think because uh you know a number of the businesses as as you mentioned councilman wiesner could reach that hundred thousand but still be walking that razor line of of profitability if profitable at all and so um yeah, I just I just want to make that clarification. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Goldman. We will move on to the police fleet update, and that is Chief Tony Slowick. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Chief Slowick, thank you very much. And I just want to start that by saying that I was one of the people that helped build Castle Park at Fort Nugent Park or the Castle Playground and with Jack Robinson right by my side, who's a clean water facility supervisor, so. All right, I'm here to talk about the police fleet update. Uh, currently, the police department has been approved by city council to replace seven of our vehicles. Uh, these are all 
uh, gas Ford Explorers uh, that are um, internal combustion engines. So we attempted to replace them in August uh, 3rd. So we got approval by council to replace five in August 3rd. That order was canceled by Ford. And we were looking at replacing them with Ford hybrids because of the cost savings that it gives to the city. Uh, we reordered those vehicles a second time and placed another order that council approved for two additional orders, bringing it to seven. Uh, that order was canceled again. And um, at that point, we um, had gone out to, and it's canceled by Ford. When I'm saying it's canceled, it's canceled by Ford. It's because they cannot fulfill the order uh, for those vehicles. So then at that point, we came to city council and uh, talked about uh, uh, a state contract with Arizona because at the time they were able to get the vehicles. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to get vehicles from them and, and their um, resources dried up as well. Um, so I'm coming you to, to you today and just talking about some of the uh, problems and solutions that we currently have. So currently we work with the state contract. Um, we work with the Arizona procurement uh, contract as well. We, off, we are talking with local dealerships in the state of Washington, and we're working with other agencies and identifying how people are getting uh, vehicles. Uh, currently Ford hybrid, uh, they're called Interceptor Utilities, or otherwise known as a Ford Explorer with a hybrid engine, um, is not being produced by Ford. Uh, they're not being sold on the civilian market. Ford has said they're keeping all the hybrids for law enforcement or first responders, and they notified us in the last month that that order will not open up until maybe November of 2024 to be filled in 2025 or as late as 2026. So it puts us in a little bit of a tough spot at the police department. We have seven vehicles that need to be replaced. Of those seven vehicles, two of them are nine years old. Uh, two of those vehicles have uh, over 130,000 miles and over 18,000 engine hours on the vehicles. Um, the, the vehicles are, have held up well for us and our city mechanics are doing a really good job in making sure we can extend their life, but we really are in a need of trying to figure out what the next solution is. So really we came up with three options as, as um, I talked with uh, a Public Works, Sandra at Public Works. First option is to order um, gas engine vehicles through the state contract. Um, the cost of that by going back to uh, gas vehicles from hybrid vehicles is um, like $2,500 uh, a year more to go back to a gas engine vehicle because it costs that much more money. Uh, the next option is to wait until our uh, hybrid contracts open up. And like I said, that that option really is not even available to us until uh, maybe November of this year. Uh, Ford has not guaranteed the price of those vehicles, and has, there's a disclaimer that says that they might raise the price of them when they do um, fill those orders. Additionally, uh, Ford has said that they're only um, allocating 50 of those vehicles per dealership um, to, to sell. So they've only got a limited amount, and those vehicles were run out. Uh, the third option, and this is the one that, um, that we are recommending, is that we look at buying some electric vehicles, test those out, and, um, and see if this is the solution for the police department. Currently, the police department has one Ford Lightning that we purchased as an admin vehicle last year that was received about a month ago. Um, been driving that vehicle. We've got a little over 600 miles on the vehicle. It is the base model, so smallest battery. Um, it can be outfitted, it's, it's a, a it's been tested as a police special service vehicle, so it's gone through the Michigan testing, so we know that this is um, a vehicle that can be used for police work. Um, and we believe that this vehicle can be outfitted and um, used for police work and um, be efficient for us and, and effective. So the two vehicles that we're currently looking at are, the first one is the Chevy Blazer EV. The contract for that vehicle uh, from the state is $65,000. Uh, outfitting for the vehicle is uh, $2,300, I'm sorry, $23,000. So it's $15,000 for light bar, striping, all of that stuff, and the, the labor to install it, uh, and a radio uh, for a total cost of about $88,000. The Ford Lightning is um, 
state contract is $50,000. Outfitting is about the same uh, for a total of $73,000. So currently there's funding available for purchasing of the seven vehicles. What was author already authorized by uh, city council was the $5,200, uh, $5,000 or that's the fund balance. Uh, we have a fund balance in 2024 of 602,000 and then uh, 2025's fund balance. Those fund balances accrue every year as, uh, as part of our equipment rental process. Um, as we talk about EVs, one of the concerns is infrastructure, and, and that's a very, you know, even in my department, my, uh, the two big, biggest concerns are one is infrastructure, the other one is uh, range anxiety, you know, how far does this thing go? And um, so infrastructure, we're actually uh, tackling this two ways. Currently, the city has a level two charger at the police department that was installed by Puget Sound Energy. That's a Puget Sound Energy uh, piece of equipment. It's owned and maintained by them. They'll replace, if it, replace it if it gets damaged. We're currently charging um, the EVs that the city owns on that charger, and it works well. Uh, to charge that vehicle from 30% to 80% takes about two hours currently with the, with the Ford Lightning that I have, that we currently have. Uh, we also are being assessed by Puget Sound Energy to be uh, considered for a, a grant of $250,000 where Puget Sound Energy would install a DC fast charger up at Public Works. Uh, we believe that this entire installation can be at no cost to the city. And once that that assessment's done, we'll bring back that information to the city council to approve. Um, that DC fast charger would allow the uh, two vehicles that we just talked about to be charged from 30% to 70 or 80% in 20 minutes. So big, big change. So currently with the Ford Lightning that we have um, and the uh, use of the Ford Lightning, I believe that that vehicle can be outfitted with all police equipment, electronics, computer, everything. Um, be able to go operate on a 12-hour shift without having to be recharged at all. And we actually believe it can go for two 12-hour shifts, um, even though we would not drain the battery that low. We would charge it up frequently and just so that uh, officers feel comfortable with the battery level. Um, the biggest thing that we have with our gas vehicles and hybrid vehicles is that our idle time is very high because when you go out into... Uh, the community, often you leave your, your vehicle running because it charges your computer, it charges your you know, uses your emergency lights, all of those things. With an electric vehicle, you know, we're eliminating the needs for gas. So the savings between a, like I, just, I talked about earlier, the savings between a hybrid and a internal combustion engine vehicle is about $2,500. The savings between an internal combustion engine and a E fully EV vehicle is between six and eight thousand dollars. The savings between a hybrid and a EV vehicle is six thousand dollars. So um, that's the numbers that we currently know based off of maintenance and gas. And that's and that's per vehicle per year. So as you start talking about, you know, we currently have we'll have ten vehicles in our fleet. That could be eighty thousand dollars of a savings every year that we're bringing in. That could be put back to an officer. That could be put back to you know, other equipment that we need to purchase. So it can be recouped. So the proposed action that I'll be bringing to you on April 2nd uh, meeting is to uh, change the motion verbiage for the purchase authorizing um, the, us to purchase electric vehicles, not just for uh, utility vehicles. Are there any questions? Thanks, Chief. Any questions from Council on this? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, if we can't get the vehicle that we were originally going for um, and there are appropriate <coughs> replacements out there or alternatives out there, it seems like the obvious way to go. So if, especially if you've already got one at the department and you, you like it, it makes sense, yeah, to get one or two of the Blazers, and if we love them, then they're easier to get, then we can go that route, so, yeah. Council Member Stuckey. Sure, it would have been nice to get those hybrids, though. I understand it's not you guys, it's no, fine, but it would have been lovely to get those I, I hybrids. I agree, I think my staff would love the hybrids, too. Yep. 
A yeah. uh, couple questions. So 88000 initial cost for the electric. Mm-hmm. How much is the initial cost for gas? I mean, you mentioned maintenance and time over time, but like, what's, what's the... Yes. Out- so right now that we're paying per year, um, let me do some quick math. Sandra sure. just sent this to me. I've got it written down here. Uh, so about gas, gas is about 3800 to forty eight hundred dollars per vehicle. I, I'm sorry, the initial the initial cost of the vehicle, the the vehicle. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Currently, so in 20, 2022, the car cost uh, fifty two thousand. Twenty twenty three, the car cost fifty five thousand. The current cost is fifty seven eight hundred, and so th- that is not a guaranteed price, and it may go up. So the initial, the in, I understand the savings over time, but the initial yep. cost is about twenty thousand dollars difference between electric to gas. Uh, well, you still have twenty thousand in outfitting. Outfitting, okay. Yeah, so it's it's like eighty thousand. So you'll be looking at eighty thousand to eighty-eight. It's pretty darn. Close. So eight thousand dollars difference. Okay, and, and in those numbers in the saving, did that include insurance and cost of battery replacement? I mean, the best guess. So the um, how often do the, the batteries go out on these? Things? Yeah, so the battery has a, a warranty over ten thousand, uh, ten years, ten year warranty. Oh, it's not a mileage. It's just no year warranty. And how often do we how often do we replace our vehicles generally? So we, we were replacing them every five years. Uh, that got extended to six years, uh, three years ago. And now we're in the per- predicament that we are uh, based off of supply chain issues and sure. all this other stuff where we're at nine years. That's nice so. to hear the battery would last the whole time regardless. That's pretty Yeah, neat. we believe actually the Ford truck probably can go be a 10-year vehicle um, with and then looking at replacing it at 10 years. Sure. Just two other questions. One, as I mentioned earlier to you, you know, I was surprised that not all, not all officers seem to be on board with the electric vehicle. I'm not talking about the people who aren't police officers. Let's let the police officers be the police officers. Yeah. But in your department, does this seem controversial within your staff? Or most, is it just like a few outliers that, nah, I don't want the electric? Like, what is the feel in your department? Yeah, so I surveyed staff about electric vehicles, hybrids, those type of things. Um, I had about 60% of the staff that said they were very comfortable of moving to electric vehicles. They were familiar with them. Um, and then the other 40% was, uh, I'm not sure, or I'll say about 30% was not sure. There was 10% that was a hard, I'm not interested in an electric vehicle. I'd want to drive a hybrid. So. And then at the, when you were asking about the grant money, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things that uh, you mentioned is that there hadn't been a study by a law enforcement, for, there's not been a study by a law enforcement agency on purpose-built police electric vehicles, and this would help gather some information. So. Are you confident, having not had a study by another department, we're kind of jumping, I mean, are you confident in this, despite not having I'm many conf- studies? I'm confident in getting four vehicles for us to go figure out what the vehicle is. I, I'm not a confident in us saying, let's, let's buy all, replace, you know, all 10 vehicles to EVs. So I, I, I'm confident that I believe that they'll work uh, for us, especially after driving the Ford Lightning and seeing sure. how that operated. I think it'll work just fine. I think that we need to get them outfitted and get my officers, officers into them. I think why do we have two different vehicles? We're looking at it as in platforms. Some people, the truck is a little bit larger of a vehicle. Um, and you're up a little bit higher. Some people are, are not as comfortable driving that vehicle. The other one is very similar to the size of the Ford Explorer that they, the Blazer and the Ford Explorer are similar in size. And what if we lose power for three days? I mean, can a generator still be able to provide that necessary Definitely. power? Definitely, and the, the generator at the police department has the ability to do that. Okay, so a three-day, a two or three-day outage, we would still be able to be okay without. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hoffmeyer. Do any local departments have the Blazer? No, they. they it's a new vehicle that just came out. Is it? Um, so, so I did. I did contact our upfitter who does who's upfit done our upfitting for like the last five years. They said that of all the electric vehicles, even Teslas, that's the vehicle that they would recommend. Oh, cool! And they and they have nice. they've demoed the vehicle. They've gone through uh, trials with it. Um, okay, those that, that's encouraging at least. Yeah, it sometimes is, yeah. sometimes new vehicles are hit and miss, but uh, they, they liked it better than the Tesla. So cool, good, yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, and I'll say this: we we looked at the Tesla. So I looked at the Teslas. The Tesla is very narrow. Uh, once you start putting a, a large person like me with broad shoulders, that stuff, type of thing, it gets very uncomfortable in the car, especially with all the equipment. Um, the Rivian. I actually had a conversation with them uh, earlier this week. And they um, are all aboard wanting to do police vehicles, but no outfitter offers a partition, transport seat, push bars for the Rivian because they haven't gone through the Michigan testing. So. Thank you. 
All right. Anybody else for the good of the order? Hearing nothing. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Moving on to engineering, pervious, permeable, and porous stormwater solutions. Our city engineer, Alex Warner, to present. All right, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we have an, an interactive prop that's being brought to the to the table there. John has that for you. It's an example of the pervious concrete. Uh, so yes, again, we'll be presenting pervious, porous, and permeable storm water solutions for you today. It's an educational presentation requested by Council. And I will be turning it over to engineering technician Jonathan Pollock for the presentation. Thanks. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council. Um, as requested, uh, this is an informational discussion of the pervious, porous, and permeable surfaces. Say that three times fast, and uh, you'll be fluent with the stormwater manual as I am. Um, we're also going to go over some pros and cons for utilizing this solution in various uh, circumstances and the feasibility uh, as to whether or not this could be deployed citywide as was requested. Uh, some definitions there, just so that we all understand the three P's, pervious, porous, and permeable, all generally mean the same thing when we're dealing with stormwater. That's to allow water to transit through the surface of where your vehicles are and reach the ground level and to infiltrate back in. Um, they are words that kind of get thrown around to describe the various things. You have porous concrete, you have permeable pavers, and you have... Uh, pervious asphalt, but they all do mean the same thing when you get down to the nitty gritty of it. Um, some history for you that may, you're recently joining council in 2019, the uh, Department of Ecology published the stormwater management manual as part of our NPDES permit for operating our separate uh, stormwater system. We are required to adhere with those uh, requirements that all apply to all new development and all redevelopment projects within the city. And of course, those uh, permeable surfaces are authorized for use as a best management practice through um, the list process and also through the low impact development process, which are triggered when a development needs to meet minimum requirement number five of the stormwater manual. So uh, when are we supposed to be using these items? Because they're not supposed to be used everywhere. First off, is when that project does trigger that minimum requirement five. And it's the first feasible option in the list method. There's a list of various BMPs to go through that you can choose from. The first one that you find is the one that's, that is feasible by your engineer. That's the one that should be applied to your site. Um, and then you don't have to keep going down the list from there. Or if you're choosing to perform through the low impact development standard, the performance standard there, you can freely choose from the list as you see fit to apply to your surfaces in there. That's your, your choices when you're proposing a development. That said, there are infeasibility criteria. In other words, when you should not use these things. The first one is if it is a roadway project. The, there are several other infeasibility criteria through it, but the big thing is that we don't want heavy truck traffic driving down the center of Highway 20 with it. It's uh, not as sturdy as your traditional hot mix asphalt, your traditional blacktop pavement that you see out there. It's also not as robust as, say, rebar reinforced concrete as you encounter on the freeway frequently. And um, another key infeasibility criteria is that if you have significant risk of transporting ground contamination, and there are sites in the city that were formerly gas stations, is the, is the common common thing that we are now redeveloping through it. If you're redeveloping one of those sites, you don't want to use an infiltration BMP like this because you run the risk of transporting petroleum and other byproducts of uh, the service station industry through the ground. On, you can affect other properties and we want to limit that as much as possible. And the manual contains a rather robust list of other criteria as well, but these are the most pertinent ones to the question being asked by us. Um, that said, permeable pavements, they do require special maintenance needs. This is an example taken from the Navy Federal site, which has porous concrete through their parking lot. Um, they have large voids, as you're observing in the little experiment there, that allows that water to pass through, but also sand, debris, 
pine needles, some organic matter, moss can latch onto and grow in them and that could seal up those voids and render the purpose of these surfaces kind of moot. So um, they do need to have proper maintenance being performed routinely, otherwise it will fail. It's also um, something to be discussed about it is that they do cost a little bit more than other options available to you. Just for that top wearing surface where you're walking or you're driving upon, you can run anywhere between 40 to $200 per square foot to install appropriately. And that's just the part that you see with your eyes. Underneath it, you have to design the under drain and the under supporting um, capacity for that water to first hit into. And then if you have to reach to a, a native soil type that can actually absorb it, you have to design a conveyance system to get over to it. So there's additional costs when you're preparing the subgrade beneath one of these surfaces that can dramatically alter what your project would eventually come out to. That said, these surfaces are in existence inside your city. There are plenty of examples from it, from the Whidbey Island Plaza development. That's um, if you've been down to the grocery outlet and the Mod Pizza, that parking lot has partial porous concrete through it. Our water division's north water tank off of um, Gun Club Road on the north side of town has an entire access road and the apron around it is entirely made out of a pervious asphalt. Our scenic heights trailhead park, the parking area is made out of porous concrete. The Veterans Memorial Park has pervious pavers through it near the architectural wall and plaza that are, are established out there. In the Navy Federal Credit Union, they built the entire parking lot with porous concrete. And we do have a little bit out there at Fort Nugent Park where we were probably first experimenting with this type of application. And there's a pathway from the sidewalk to the football bleachers up there that is made out of this material as well. That said, it is a helpful BMP, especially in areas where we want to maximize the land use of what's going on there. Um, it's cost effective in order to manage it. It helps you avoid losing that land and also designing a large detention facility because that can also drive up costs for your project. Um, some other options that are out there to manage stormwater may be rather intensive as far as the space that they need to operate. Sheeting stormwater across land, for instance, requires a certain distance in order to achieve that appropriate treatment. And so you can arrive at, like they did at Whidbey Island Plaza, with a solution that can fit within that desired envelope for that business's operation. But it can't really be used everywhere, as we discussed with the infeasibility criteria. Um, some of the other finer points is if the groundwater level is too close to the surface, you may end up with exacerbating existing flooding conditions there with soils that can't infiltrate well. Um, if you have a surface that you're trying to use this on that's greater than 6%, the surface may erode faster as the vehicles or pedestrians move across it, you may end up wearing that upper layer off. And of course, there's the ongoing concern of continuous maintenance that needs to be performed to it. And uh, otherwise, you do end up overwhelming other systems that are surrounding it to support those, uh, those BMPs. So this is our current city approach. In our public projects, we do research the, uh, the entire scope of it thoroughly, including the, all the measures to meet with the stormwater permits requirements try to deploy those pervious surfaces in areas where it's feasible according to the criteria and when doing so is not expected to be exceedingly cost prohibitive. That is that we wish to be a good steward of the money that you and the citizens trust us with and that when doing so would benefit the greater public environment and that's us being a good steward of our citizens' health. As far as private developers go, we simply require them to adhere to the, the manual's requirements for the size and the scope of their projects that are going on. The 2019 manual already requires them to perform extensive geotechnical investigations to inform what their stormwater design should be and what's capable of going into their site. 
And in so doing, it allows them greater flexibility to meet those requirements without being restricted to one particular method. And um, it allows us to uniformly treat all applicants equally without um, restricting their approaches to creative solutions. So some pros and cons. The pro is that it does promote infiltration. And with our aquifer level, we like to try to get as much rainwater back into the ground as possible where we can do it safely and it makes sense to do so. Some cons though, if this was to be mandated by you in the future, that would tie the hands of your local engineers and your, your local applicants for development and redevelopment. Um, it might violate the standards for the manuals criteria and um, you may exacerbate conditions for site flooding both on site and downstream. And it could unnecessarily increase development costs. So you do have the right as council to implement stormwater requirements that go above and beyond what ecology has set forth. You would accomplish that through an amendment to the municipal code and it is technically feasible for you to do so. However, staff does not recommend this approach for the reasons that we have gone over tonight. If you have any questions or need further elaboration, I am happy to take them at this time. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll go to Council Member Wiesner. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and thanks for that presentation. Uh, yeah, it's not right for every project, right? Uh, but at the same time, I, I guess maybe my twist on this, right, is up until now, um, um, retention and detention obviously has been at the forefront, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's been typically the easiest solution, right? Figure out the amount of storm runoff you have coming off the property, build a pond big enough to hold it. Uh, we've got to get away from that. Um, you know, our density things that we're talking about and the things we're talking about with redevelopment, et cetera, we're creating permanent non-buildable hunks of property, right? Because to, to go in and remove that retention and replace it with something else is you know, quite cost prohibitive, right? And so, you know, once those retention areas are created, they're never going to be uncreated unless, you know, there's a drastic change in, in, in rules at the, the state level. Yeah. Um, they're also dangerous. Um, mosquito habitants, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's all sorts of things that says retention and detention ponds are, are not in the best interest of the city moving forward with everything that we've learned and everything we know about what our future is going to be. Um, up until now, that's been the number one line of defense, and uh, permeable surfaces has been kind of the last line of defense because of the, the cost. And there, you know, there was a period where we really didn't know how much maintenance they were going to take. And, you know, is this really going to work? How does that, I mean, you know. Um, and, and then we've seen some issues such as Navy Federal where you got that moss up there kind of starting to seal that parking lot a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess what I'd like to see is maybe a flip around, right, where, where we're not necessarily requiring permeable, but we're trying to move some of those to the top of the list and trying to create that retention detention issue as kind of the last line of defense. We still want it in our pocket. We, we, you know, we still need it so that we're not uh, hamstringing developers. Um, still need to give them that, that flexibility for free each development, but you know maybe within our code we, 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 we look at prioritizing that or, or um, you know in our code obviously we have the, the, the ability to state what, what's the ideal situation that we would like to see as a city and what are the uh, uh, lesser desirable, the desirable outcomes during the, the uh, uh, plan development process. And you know maybe we get in the statement at there that we want, other options looked at before determining that retention and detention is, is the right solution for the project, uh, which I think is just a little bit of a flip, and, and what, at least what, we, what we've seen over the last few years in our city. So that would be my suggestion, right, to certainly move slowly. Uh, this is still fairly new technology, although it's been, what, eight years or so, I think, uh, since it came out, but uh, you know, not jump in with both feet, but at the same time, you know, try to promote the developers to come to us with different, innovative, state-of-the-art, best management practices, which are being developed, you know, every day, you know, down in the big city where it's nothing but asphalt. Um, come to us with those ideas as as as, as a forefront 
um, and, and, and uh, kind of discourage that retention, detention, uh, certainly leave that option in our bag, um, but, but make that kind of the last ditch op option. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Council Hoffmeyer. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor, could I uh, first respond to that as well? I'm sorry. Uh, so the stormwater manual does encourage the use of these pervious pavements and there's the, the list that John mentioned of you need to show that it's infeasible on your site before you move down to the more traditional um, detention ponds. So that what, what you're bringing, you know, the points you're making are, are very valid points. I think that's already somewhat happening in the background that you're not seeing as part of that Department of Ecology stormwater manual. Um, so you know, we can continue the conversation of what that promoting of these new <coughs> BMPs looks like. Um, but I think it's, it's capturing it pretty well already. And there might be some better avenues to promote it. You know, as the, the value of land increases and there's less buildable land, developers will want to be, you know, multi-purpose use of that space where you're putting stormwater beneath the parking lot. You're not setting aside a third of the property for a detention pond. So that might come, you know, organically out of some other changes we're making at the city. Yeah. Council Member Hopmeyer. Uh, on a similar, similar vein there, Alex, and that's, that's about exactly what I was going to ask. Uh, you know, uh, in areas where you have a lot of density, such as the the fourplex across the road here, where you have a where you have a vault under the parking lot instead of uh, the impervious, what's the what's the cost benefit on that? Does it kind of even out usually? Or uh, yeah, I think that's really you know the developers mm -hmm. um, putting their pencil to paper and determining. Um, it usually is it allows for extra units to be built on sites. And you know we're fully supportive of that. Yeah. So I'm not doing the cost-benefit analysis on my end. You know, if they're meeting the requirements and they're proposing it. Then yeah, I, I wouldn't want to totally uh, tie their hands. And uh, you know, I think currently how it is, just having it as a tool in their toolbox, I think is a, a pretty good idea. Uh, but but on to what what Councillor Wiesner said. You know, for for the areas of more density in our in our city, maybe it is worth requiring that they either vault it or go with impervious. Um, impervious in itself just so strange because usually the goal of uh, pavements to to be pervious. Uh, so uh, the other question I had is with regards to. I mean, like, like with a backflow preventer, we, we require a test annually. Uh, so coming back to this, is there, is there some maintenance requirement that we're requiring that they show us that it's been vacuumed? Uh, yes, Councillor. Uh, currently, we do have our stormwater inspector, Ms. Kendall Sullivan. She is going around to the various sites, making sure that their BMPs, their detention ponds, their uh, filtration devices, control structures, all of the all of that big toolbox that's available to the developer to install to manage stormwater, the parts and pieces of those puzzles are being maintained and, and kept up. She performs an annual inspection on each of them. And that, that applies to the, uh, the impervious parking lots as well? Yes. Okay. And the only other question I had is, is there a life expectancy on those? And if one of them fails, who, who says, hey, you need to put in a new parking lot? So... I'm unaware of what a life expectancy for any one of these surfaces would be because that's highly variable based upon what is transiting across it. The plaza, for instance, at Veterans Memorial Park, I imagine will last for decades, but a highly trafficked parking lot, such as the one that's <coughs> downtown here off of Bayshore Drive with that commercial development may last significantly less, or with proper upkeep, it may last as long as their neighboring standard parking lots. It's just difficult to say at this juncture in time. But when they do fail and they need to come back into compliance with what they had originally proposed, that would be the public works department that would first say, hey, something's wrong here. Please come up with a plan to address it. And we would try to partner with those business owners and those property owners as best as we could before rolling out more stringent enforcement measures. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for the work that went into this. The 
presentation and the materials in the packet answered every single one of my questions before I even had a chance to ask them. So thank you. And the demonstration. Yeah, and, well, and we, we love a, a good <laughs> DIY visual aid. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else for the good of the order? All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Thank you. Last but not least, we are moving on to administration action item, <laughs> professional services agreement with Periscope Legal for Indigent Defense. Introducing is our interim city administrator, Sabrina Combs. Good evening. Oh, I'm not as tall as John Pollock. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Chuck. Uh, so I am presenting an action item this evening, and it's for a professional service agreement with Periscope Legal. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So um, just to give you some background, the city had a contract with Island Defense um, since 2015. That contract ended at the end of 2023 um, because Island Defense did not wish to renew that agreement. So the former city administrator contracted for temporary services through the end of March with Andrew Perkins of Periscope Legal. And since then, we have transferred the cases from Island Defense to Periscope Legal. So the, some of the requirements we have for these types of contracts is that we have to hire an attorney to provide this service or the cases will be dismissed by the court. Additionally, we are required to pay a minimum of $150 an hour then just to let you know, our caseloads are increasing and there is a higher rate. With the previous contract, we were paying $75 an hour. Um, now with this new requirement of $150 an hour, that and increasing cases has changed the amount. So the city needs a temporary contract so that we can conduct an RFP process for a long-term provider of these services. Uh, we anticipate that to take three to six months. We have an awesome procurement team, but I don't want to push them, so I'm making sure we at least have the six months to do that. Uh, so the temporary contract that we are working on, uh, the current provider, Pericos Periscope Legal, agreed and signed an agreement for a six-month contract at the $150 an hour rate. And again, that's so that we have time to do the RFP. And then if council approves the contract, the mayor can sign that agreement. And then the city can continue to utilize those services through the RFP process. So the other item we have as part of this action item is we have some invoicing that we need to address. The, again, for the higher costs, uh, the mayor is only authorized to sign to approve $30,000 a year. These higher invoices have led to some invoices that we have not paid yet and one that is pending. So we have the February invoice for $19,890 and the March invoice that has not been billed yet. So we need to get authorization from you as our council to pay those invoices. So our next steps are to finalize the contract so that we have these services in a long-term contract, conduct the RFP process to address that. As part of that, we are currently seeing comparables from other cities uh, that shows us what they are seeing, and it is pretty consistent with what we've expected. The, and then I will return to council with the long-term contract after the RFP process, and then finance is going to bring a budget amendment to address the additional costs. So with that, I have a motion to authorize the mayor to sign the professional service agreement and pay the invoices for February and March that we've already received, or one that we've received and one that's coming. Are there any questions? All right, so before I turn it over to you to question, you guys good to make sure there isn't anyone here that may want to speak to this? Okay, so Julie, with that, have we had any no, Mayor, we've received no comment okay. for the item. So is there anyone with us this evening that wishes to speak to this issue before we take action on it? No. Okay. So with that, I will turn it over to Council for questions and comments. Yes, Council Member Wiesner. Thank you, Mayor. Sabrina, you know, one of the things that interests me up there, you know, is that we have a, an increase in caseload and, and, you know, not necessarily a, a bad thing, right? But I guess I'm kind of curious, in, in our current system, I know normally, you know, a city attorney is typically the prosecuting attorney of the city, and normally that, that city attorney as the prosecutor decides what cases to prosecute. How is our system currently working? Because uh, is, isn't our prosecutor kind of a, a consultant or, or uh, contracted? So, oh, Hillary, sounds like Hillary. I, I'm happy to chime in. <laughs> uh, most cities in this area use a slightly different system. 
Your city attorney is like your in-house counsel. That would be me. We represent the city and all of its city actors. And then we hire out prosecution services for your uh, municipal and district court level criminal city prosecutions. And then your public defender has to be hired by your administration. Um, and, and the police have to have their hands off of that entirely. Um, so that's, that's the system that's common here, and that's the system that you guys are using. I'm happy to answer any further questions, though. So I guess ultimately, who is the decision maker on what cases to prosecute and what cases not? That is a, a combination of two entities. It's uh, Zachary Thomas, who's been retained as your city prosecutors. They're uh, uh, essentially a Snohomish County-based law firm that do exclusively that type of prosecution services. You did have an in-house prosecutor for a while, but your caseload became so high that it became much more cost-effective to use Zach or Thomas. Um, and so they make the charging decisions in coordination with your police. And then your the, the defense attorney, the indigent uh, services, have to be sort of siloed for good reason. You don't want your prosecutor or your police department interfering with that. So the public defense contract that you're looking about and that you're looking at that you're talking about doing the RFP for are intentionally separate from either of those bodies because they're representing the defendants. And, and, and maybe Chief Slowick or maybe Hillary can answer this. How, how much input does our police department have? And I mean, just it just seems odd, you know, when you have a consult in a hired contracted firm that that makes their own decision as to what you know cases they're going to take which you know you know yeah by, basically by is law, their pay right their pay but, right so absolutely by law your police and to some regard your prosecutor and i really try and keep our hands off of the choice of public defender um but your police do have a lot of input when and, and as do I when we talk about hiring your prosecutor. And your prosecutor is the one who's in charge of the charging decisions. So, so we have a lot of input on who we hire for that. But, but again, the prosecutor who is a contracted firm who, who gets a benefit from deciding what cases to prosecute is, is making those decisions. I, you, you get, I'm trying to just get back to this increased caseload and I'm not saying that necessarily there's a there's a problem here but that just seems odd to me from a you know no, perspective I, I of, understand I understand it's almost like the writing a blank check right no I, I completely understand um the difference is that uh, we're, the caseload limits that we're talking about are imposed on public defenders because Previously, public defenders were overworked and underpaid, right? They were being assigned so many defendants. And I think, I think the last time we discussed this, your mayor pro tem actually chimed in with, with some of the rationale behind it. But uh, public defenders and attorneys who are assigned indigent defense uh, services and clients have to get paid um, commensurate with their caseload. The state Supreme Court thinks that, and the Washington State Bar Association thinks that these defense attorneys have way too many clients and therefore can't represent them properly. So that people who don't have the resources to represent themselves are not getting um, fair or full representation. So that's the caseload we're talking about. Well, I agree with you that when it comes to your prosecutor, your prosecutors in conjunction with your police are far more in control of how many cases they have because they get to make those charging decisions. But your stopgap measure is your chief of police, and I can't see if he's in the house right now, um, and, and the police. Oh, there you are. I see your hand in the back of your head now. Um, if your police department came to your council and said, hey, our prosecutors aren't charging what we're asking them to. They're, they're either charging too much or they're not charging enough, or, um, you know, then, then you would know and you could change your prosecution services. I've only heard glowing reviews about Zachary Thomas from your police, depart police department. I don't think there's a problem there. I think they're charging totally appropriately from what I've heard. Um, but that's, that's, your, that's your check on that. Okay, and that, that's exactly what I was trying to get to, right? That we have a check yep. and balance somewhere in-house because anytime you see increased caseload, increased cost, right? I mean, I, I want to trace it back to, 
to why are those caseloads and costs increasing. I certainly understand that we've got to provide uh, indigent uh, defense. I understand that that's an obligation. It's a necessary evil of of both sides of law enforcement, right, and uh, that the city has to deal with. But I, I just want to make sure that that increased cost and increased caseload doesn't have an underlying root. And it just always seemed odd to me that if, you know, we hire a consultant and we give the consultant control over, you know, what they can charge us for and what they, you know, what, what tasks they take on, uh, uh, it just seems like a, an odd deal. But uh, to, to think that Chief Slowick does have a lot of input on that and Chief Slowick is our stopgap and Chief Slowick's our guy to go to when, when we have issues with that, that, that provides some comfort. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wiesner, Councilmember Hoffmeyer. So looking at the screen there, I, I seen two options. It was approve of the six month contract or quit prosecuting the individuals that we arrest, I suppose. Is there, is there a third option? Is there an option to go month to month with the prosecutor? Um, what we want to make sure is that we have this addressed so that we can go through the RFP process and we're not delaying that process by continually bringing back a contract. Um, we did talk with Sandra Place and just the timing to do that. She's already been doing a lot of research and getting those documents ready, but it's going to take some time to get through that process. And she has other recruit, um, other things that she's doing procurement process for. And so we really want to make sure that we put in enough time to do this right. So that's what we're that's what we're planning for. And the two action items are paying the invoices, getting the authority to do that, and sign the contract. And then those, those invoices, I'm not really sure the timing of everything, and a, a lot's happened in the last 88 days or whatever it's been, obviously. Um, with, the, with those and with the mayor's spending authority, I understand for a contract it's $30,000 a year. Um, if it were month to month, is it 30000 per invoice, or is it still limited to 30000 per vendor? It's total for the vendor. So what okay. we are trying Understood. to make sure that we're doing is, um, like I said, addressing that so that we have enough time to take care of this. Understood. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else for the good of the order? Yes, Councilmember Wigginstein. Just wanted to clarify, we're talking about uh, public defense and this contract only, right? Indigent and public then, defense, yeah, yes. So all the other stuff is just kind of other stuff at this point. Um, I'd like to move to authorize the mayor to sign the professional service agreement with Andrew Perkins of Periscope Legal and authorize payment of service for services rendered in February and March of 2024. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, before we take a vote, is there any further discussion on this issue? Hearing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, did that motion also include paying those two invoices? Yes. Okay, just making sure. So, um, last but not least, the monthly department report, Ms. Sabrina. So, uh, we have the report in the packet. If you have any questions for me, just let me know, and we will make sure to get you those responses. Great report. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mikhail, and all of our departments for submitting their reports. We appreciate it. <laughs> Yes, and then so now I will turn it over to council for comments that you have in closing. Mayor Pertim. I just wanted to say thank you. I, I noticed on the permit report that you replaced the parcel numbers with a physical address, which is much easier for us to know where something is happening. So thank you. Great. Yes, Councilman Rogenstein. I'd like to just say that the, the reports that you did submit in the much more cleaner than I've seen in a while. It's more organized and, and I'm super grateful for that as well. Thank you. And thank you to Mikhail and our staff for putting those together. It's really great. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. With that, thank you. At this time, there will be no further business.